Thank you. So let me give you just a little breakdown, a little run through today about the Comprehensive Prevention Plan Learning Series. This series is sponsored by Casey Family Programs, who's with us today, in partnership with Implematics, who will be moderating this conversation, Caltrin and CDSS. It's intended to assist counties in preparing for the implementation of their unique comprehensive prevention plan. The series maps directly to the nine readiness domains for California's Family First Prevention Services, FFPS, program and addresses requirements outlined in the ACL, that's the All County Letter 2223 and AB 153. So monthly form, uh, monthly learning forums like this will provide details on the domains and associated national and local perspectives on readiness work. Each forum will be followed by an interactive question, well, a Q&A, which will also follow this session in a few weeks to allow for more detailed discussion and clarification. Although it's encouraged, it's not required that you attend the full series and each session does require its own separate registration. And as you can see in the chat, this is where you can find more about the series and register for the individual sessions that come up. So with that, I'd like to pass off to our first panelist, Dana Blackwell. Dana Blackwell is the Senior Director of Strategic Consultation and brings over 20 years of child welfare and public policy experience to her role at Casey Family Programs. In this capacity, Dana leads Casey's work in California, including statewide, pro, uh, statewide partnerships, initiatives, and system improvement activities. So hello, Dana, and good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jessica. And thanks everybody for joining us for the second forum in our learning series, Building the Team, Prevention System Governance and Collaboration. Our hope is that you leave today's webinar with ideas about how you can build on the existing infrastructure in your county to deepen your collaborative bench. When I think about program implementation, large or small, I know um, implementation and program strategies fall in one of two buckets, technical or adaptive. Our first learning form was squarely in the technical bucket. I think governance and stakeholder engagement lean towards the adaptive. The system's behaviors need to change in ways that are inclusive, collaborative, integrated, and coordinated. Not an easy task by any means. Today's presenters will provide you with ideas for how to create the adaptive connectivity um, for you all to build your county's comprehensive prevention plan. We have a full slate of presenters um, this morning. So I will not go through their bios as I've done previously, but we'll share with you who we have with us and get to it. Um, so first up, we have Richard Connect, who is a managing partner of Integrated Human Services. And then our team from Ventura includes David Swanson Hollinger, Salita Dabrowski, Jackie Flores Ortega, and Cheryl Fox. Um, and then we will be joined by the president and CEO of Shield for Family, Katherine Eisenhower, and from Casey Family Programs, Jack Trope, who leads um, our work in Indian child welfare. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kush Cooper, who will um, moderate today's session. Thank you, and we'll get to it. Kush? Thank you, Dana. And as always, really cherish the partnership we have with, with Casey Family Programs to support counties. Uh, there's a poll I understand we are about to launch uh, before I introduce you to our, um, the readiness domain we're gonna engage with today. Absolutely, thank you, Kush. So you've heard a little bit about this series, who, what it is, why it is. And just before we get started, we just want to learn a little bit about you. So what you'll see is I am launching a poll asking, which region are you joining us from? So if you can see that launched poll, I'm going to ask that you just take a moment and select which region are you? Ooh, thank you. I see them coming in very quickly here. Wonderful. It looks like we are at about 60% and quickly rising. Wonderful. 
you know what? You came to participate today. I love it. So we're at 78, oh, 79, 80% participation. I'm going to go ahead and stop that poll and let me share the results. Wonderful. So it looks like we have a spread throughout the state and some of you are working in statewide, uh, in statewide regions. That's wonderful. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to stop sharing that here. And the next poll I have for you is which role, if you had to select a role that best describes um, the role that you're in while attending this forum, which one would it be? I'm going to ask you to answer in the All right, I see, I know there's more options. Don't forget you can scroll down. So if you're seeing anything on there, just scroll down a little bit. Wonderful. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the poll and share so that we can see. Uh, Kush, if I'm so interested in what your thoughts are about this. Well, it, it you know, as we would imagine, um, we've got the, the four agencies well represented, and that's about 60% of, of our audience. And, you know, that, that, that tells us something, right? That tells us something that um, perhaps we're still thinking about FFPS as um, central to the four E agencies, and there's work we all need to do to make sure that um, all folks, particularly if we're gonna create healthy communities, and, and address people who are not quite yet at the door of the child welfare system, we're gonna have to cast our net wider, both from a, just a marketing perspective and just it's something to note locally, right? Who do you want at the next ones? Um, and you know, for the 4E agencies, you don't wanna be left holding the proverbial bag for prevention, right? Because it is everyone's, it is everyone's job job. And so that's just, that's just what that tells me. There's just a little work to do, uh, but we're on our way. All right. That concludes that's the polls. All right. Well, then let's, as Dana said, get to it because uh, we have a, we have some ground to cover today, and we've got just wonderful presenters. And I want to leave all the time possible for them. So just to orient you to sort of where on the map we are with regard to readiness domains. Um, these are the nine readiness domains that, you know, those of us that are in the implementation world think are critical uh, to getting you ready to deliver services. And, and as, a, as a highlight underlying note here, these are readiness to deliver services, not necessarily readiness to write your plan. Right. Writing the plan is just one step on the way to delivering services, right? So hold that context in mind when you think about these readiness domains. Working on these readiness domains should help you write your plan, right? But the plan isn't the end, right? Delivering services to our families um, is the end game here. So on um, the, the ones that are highlighted and outlined in red are the two that we're going to address today. Uh, we address the fiscal and funding seminar. That's the, the, the more technical one that Dana was referring to that we had on June 29th. And then on um, August 17th, I hope I have that right, um, we are going to be delving into program design and service array uh, as a little sneak preview of what's coming up. Uh, our learning series will cover um, the first six of these. Um, Automation and the reporting that automation will help us do um, is still sort of in development um, and, and that's a ways away. So when we as a state are further ahead um, on those, we'll probably have learning forums for those perhaps next year, but those aren't part of this year's series. I wanna just tell you a little bit about how I see these domains and what goes into them. And your speakers have seen these, right? And they have fashioned their talks to address these elements uh, and, and these, you know, the particular states of readiness that go with them. So I just want to quickly orient you to, to, to them so, uh, so you, can, you can know what they know. So what are the 
elements that go into the governance domain. Okay, let's talk about that one first and we'll get to stakeholder collaboration because they are inextricably tied. This collaborative cross-sector governance structure should be across 4E agencies and tribal governments and should set direction and strategy, allocate resources, make decisions and oversee progress. It should not have only the 4E agencies, although they are ultimately accountable for implementation of FFPS because we are preventing foster care after all. Um, but to the degree that you can have the non 4 agencies that are the public health, behavioral health, uh, particularly those to education, um, public safety represented, there's going to be um, you're going to have something that's really implementable without rework later because when you bring folks to the table late they have input and what you've designed may need to get redesigned so to have everybody at the table early will prevent rework later this collaborative structure should include the key stakeholder groups in in the county that advise review and validate prevention services program and those include most importantly our folks with lived experience and those disproportionately represented in the child welfare system um, whose needs we're trying to meet. Uh, provider networks who are going to be actually ultimately delivering the services well, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Advocacy organizations and community-based organizations and cultural experts who all know the needs of the communities where we want to embed these services. Um, Collaborative structure, depending on the size of your county, may include a separate implementation team or that governance structure may be the implementation team. And for sure, um, what we call um, the executive sponsors of the effort from the 4E agencies should for sure be represented because ultimately they're going to be accountable for implementation, as I said before. And what are the kinds of things, this is not an exhaustive list, but what are the kinds of things that this governance body should be doing? Well, it should be identifying key integration points with existing prevention services programming. You're already doing some of this now and you wanna know what to bring forward and know what not to. Um, and, and these key integration points are, are, are chosen and identified based on data. Um, this governance body would ensure that there aren't redundancies um, or gaps in service offerings across the county um, and that federal state fiscal requirements are uniformly and consistently applied. Equitable practices exist in the application of FFPS. They would do, they would review and input and apply input to the design and implementation of this local child welfare prevention services program and be accountable for its ongoing performance, right? So it does one thing until the plan's written and it needs to morph to do another thing once the plan's in and yet another thing once the services are actually implemented, right? Then it becomes a monitoring role. The governance body, want, you want it to integrate um, and, and, you know, and, and those, are the those are the leaders you want at the table. Those are the, that are good at integrating work that for agencies that haven't historically worked together to resolve what we know drives ultimately um, family instability, economic issues, food and housing insecurity, um, and such things that put families at risk of foster care. Uh, and so these agencies include public health, education, community safety. We all haven't necessarily worked together, um, but we've been serving the same families. Uh, uh, you'll 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 hear Richard Connect talk about that a little later, um, and. The governance body should provide recommendations for best practices um, often to achieve success within prevention strategies across agencies. And if I had a clipboard and I was saying, okay, your governance structure is ready, uh, what I'd be looking for is that this structure is established, like there's a picture of it, there's decision-making protocols uh, that are clear to everyone for this cross-sector team, and this structure should include and ideally have written down what are the defined roles and responsibilities for each agency, right? So something like a charter should exist that defines those roles 
There should be data sharing agreements in place. There may already be in place that need to be brought forward. Guidance, reporting requirements, and feedback loops have been established. Again, and somebody can point to them, especially to engage with community partners, CDOs, and experts with lived experience. Always ensuring that the strategy, strategies that this governance structure has chosen are trauma-informed and evidence-based. And probably most importantly, the state, there's an established stakeholder process that is not only clear to the governance body, but also clear to the stakeholders with regard to how we're gonna incorporate lived experience um, and those disproportionately at risk in a meaningful, non-tokenistic and trauma-informed manner, All right? And then let's just move quickly to stakeholder collaboration, which should also be represented in whatever written document describes your governance structure and very clearly determine how parents and youth with lived experience in the county are part of design, review, and input during implementation and ongoing administration, right? So again, not a rubber stamp, like in involved from the beginning. Um, that there are guidelines in place to ensure cultural responsiveness uh, in evidence-based practices and other prevention services, and that there's a systematic engagement with diverse communities who understand their people so they can guide program design. Um, and again, community-based organizations and provider networks how where services are going to get delivered and contracts are going to get expanded. What is our established way to guide and communicate with those networks and those providers? Right? So those should be part of this governance structure. And then again, back to our proverbial clipboard, you'd be ready if I saw a written process in place that had been communicated where stakeholders are able to review or consult on guidance and decisions that are being put out, provide feedback, receive notification regarding reasons their recommendations may have not been incorporated. That's really important to get back to folks when we, we can't incorporate everything they've recommended, that there's a strategy to engage providers, those with lived experience and EBP purveyors, perhaps also in discussions with regard to how services are gonna roll out and that guidance has been provided on how information is going to be shared between providers and the 4E agencies and what are the expectations for data collection and reporting, uh, particularly fiscal. All right. So just you don't have to remember any of this. You have this in the slides and any consultant worth their salt should be guiding you through this. Um, so if you have consultants, show them these domains and let them know that we need to perform to them. Um, so without so. That will end the show and tell of the, the readiness domains. And I wanna turn it over to, to our first presenter. Um, Richard Connect's gonna talk to you about, so how do you go about identifying this cross sector body um, uh, from existing bodies or creating a new one? And what are some of the considerations to keep in mind as you go about choosing uh, this, this body? All right, Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Kush, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a great table setting. Really appreciate um, the uh, richness of the um, adaptive dilemma, right, that we're all facing here in terms of how do we approach uh, a good comprehensive prevention prevention planning process. Um, you can go ahead and advance to that next slide. Um, I really appreciated Dana's uh, framing this in terms of uh, an adaptive need, right? Like uh, far too often when we implement programs, we do it in a highly technical way. Um, we focus on policy and practice, and those things are important, but we forget about um, standing off the dance floor, right? In the words of Ron Heifetz, uh, would suggest we get into the balcony and look at the big picture. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the connectivity here between collaboration and governance and some of the historic system of care work, which we think gives you a chance to get off the dance floor and, and see the process from a larger perspective. So I uh, really appreciate the chance to spend some time with you. Uh, just introducing this a little bit with a, a little bit of context. You may be wrestling early in your thinking about uh, wondering, you know, how am I going to find the people and the resources uh, to do a good planning process and to implement the, the act? Um, I may be wondering uh, about where I'm going to find the certified public expenditure to match the either the 4E or the Medi-Cal dollars that are going to be required here. 
Um, I may be wondering how my efforts are going to affect the DEI, the diversity, equity, inclusion work, or how my how's my prevention plan going to have an impact on disproportionality in my county or my my community. Uh, and ultimately, the big question for uh, for leaders at a management level is how am I going to connect my comprehensive prevention plan uh, to the existing prevention plan that happens uh, elsewhere in my county? Next slide. <clears throat> So um, by way of context, then uh, additionally, the, the, the adaptive dilemma um, graphically captured here uh, in, in terms of how the public sector partners represented here in these vertical silos, uh, they're all captured now in California uniquely within a, a county memorandum of understanding in a, a, an Assembly Bill 2083 driven world. Um, they're either in your MOU or will soon be um, and within that MOU process, we find ourselves at least on paper in an integrated relationship with other organizations, other departments, other agencies. That integrated relationship is the pathway to innovation, and innovation is really demanded by good prevention work. And the complexity of this uh, in, the, in the, the horizontal um, bars is just um, a, a, a reminder that in planning and getting ready, and implementing as leaders, we attend to not just the policy and leadership, but to the, um, the ultimate uh, uh, effects on practice and in community, which is where kids get their, their effective care most often. Next slide. So there are um, a number of options that one county partnership can take towards uh, effective planning uh, and, and putting a a process into place, um, and this is a, at least a partial list. You've got child abuse prevention councils. Uh, you've got a first five commission process, or if you're in a larger county um, with a really well developed uh, first five process, you may have a subcommittee there. Um, many of you are in counties where there there's now a three or four year legacy of prevention cabinet work, and of course there could be other existing prevention coordination groups. Uh, all of those. Uh, in addition to your interagency leadership team, which is a mandate now under your Assembly Bill 2083. The answer to the question about which of these bodies do I use to do my planning is really contingent on a, a number of factors. The, certainly the capacity of your existing groups to do a good plan, the size of your county. Certainly um, it's going to be different in a, a big metropolitan county uh, than it will be in a small rural county and ultimately whether or not your Assembly Bill 2083 system of care interagency leadership team functions effectively. Um, and so we'll talk about the, the interface of those, uh, those things. Um, obviously, it's unlikely that the ILT is going to do your planning process, right? Your executive body is not going to carry out your plan in most cases, but you're going you're to certainly want to have their partnership available to you because it's within those uh, relationships, interagency relationships, where you're gonna find the resources, the data, the information, the dollars, the people to help you do an effective plan. So um, ultimately, um, again, by way of additional context, the, the readiness domain is inherently interdependent. Um, and Kush has already set the table for this, but it's, it's within partnership that you recognize or you can recognize that my partners have data uh, about the needs and services in existing reports and plans. And we live in silos, right, typically, and we don't always know, we often don't know what those plans and reports have in them. Um, same, for, uh, same for the contracts that our partners might have. We often don't know what's in those contracts when they're, when they're executed by different departments. Um, our partners have dollars that can be used, again, as match to maximize the federal allocations that are available to us under the FFPSA Part 1 waiver or under, um, under Medi-Cal. Ultimately, um, what I'd like to recommend is my bias, and I think um, uh, th that of others potentially this morning, is that when, when done with fidelity and fullness, the system of care architecture that AB 2083 provides us via interagency leadership and the other provisions of the MOU gives us this transformative opportunity for sharing governance with one another around prevention planning and ultimately with parents, youth, and tribes to address the system-wide issues that we have um, across the system. You're gonna hear Jack talk 
later this morning about um, tribal engagement and the richness that will come when we do that effectively in terms of prevention. Next slide, thanks, Kakush. Um, so if you're a little bit less familiar with the Children's System of Care under Assembly Bill 183, the intention of this is to, it, it really is um, uh, the intention of system of care to meet the moment. Uh, in other words, Assembly Bill 283 was meant for this point in time and for many others like it, right? A good prevention plan, uh, if it's comprehensive, can't be done in a silo. Uh, we have, have to have other public partners uh, in, in the conversation, and they're here to help us identify the candidate population. They're here, help, they're here to help us identify what services to offer and by which local organization or in what kind of a partnership that should that, that should form. Uh, that, that relationship at the interagency level is going to help us leverage and account for the various funding um, vehicles that are available, not just uh, the federal funding, but the state and local dollars that are also in your prevention continuum already, or that could be. Uh, ultimately, um, the goal, of course, is a full continuum, a full connected um, tapestry, if you will, of prevention services across a whole system. I've got here included a, a little quote that I've lifted from the state 20 to 3 toolkit. When you ponder on one of the major objectives here is to ensure that the system's partners, programs, and policies reflect a coordinated, integrated, and effective delivery of services. That's part and parcel of CPP work or, or family first prevention services work, right? So really um, just wanna make the case that uh, on some level your ILT is gonna have to be involved um, uh, in this process um, very, very directly or as a resource uh, to you to let your planning group um, take its steps forward. Next slide. <clears throat> a little more concretely here, then let's point out where some of the um, functional elements of the 2083 <clears throat> architecture support not just the readiness domains of, uh, of governance and collaboration, but many others. So on the left-hand side here, um, you'll see five of the 11 required MOU elements. This is in your existing 2083 MOU. You've outlined at least minimally how you're going to do things like financial resource management, interagency leadership, screening, assessment, entry to care, um, cross-training and recruitment, and the sharing of data and information. And I've tried to point out with some arrows here, although this is not exhaustive, where each of those articulations within your MOU should give you a platform. If, if your MOU is, um, is well articulated and you've begun to execute that MOU, it gives you a platform then for approaching the readiness domain. Uh, and so you can see the connectivity here that if we've invested in system of care in the last two and a half years since it became an obligation, then we are far more ready and likely to be able to approach the readiness domains in a thoughtful, planful way and in connected partnership with others. And we're going to explore um, a number of these, a couple of these domains at least, in significant detail. Next slide. So if you uh, identify, and we hope that you will, uh, on some level, the, your interagency leadership team and your system of care as kind of the oversight uh, or planning body, it presents a challenge, right? Uh, if you think back to that previous slide, uh, we talked about the public partners in vertical silos. While they're part and parcel of your MOU work, your community partners typically, unless you're in a rare county where you have um, signed on your critical community-based organizations, they're not in your system of care governance process. Um, so that one of the challenges here is to, is to connect community-based partners and tribal communities and service uh, partners uh, for native peoples into your process. In addition, you're gonna find that it's a challenge probably to just locate time on your interagency leadership team agenda. There, it's an executive body that's wrestling with other challenges and so, prioritizing um, a good comprehensive prevention planning process and FFPS implementation into that agenda will be a challenge. Ultimately, um, if, if it's not done well, it's gonna be difficult to address the diversity, equity, inclusion issues, uh, over-representation issues, um, absent those partnerships. So while we wanna advocate that the ILT is the body to oversee and orchestrate and support this, it does pre prevent one of these kind of micro dilemmas uh, 
uh, and, that, and that your ILT is going to have to adapt its practice in, in a way that gives voice, um, uh, power, um, governance capacity, egalitarian decision making, if you will, into communities and, uh, and, and, and tribal persons. The opportunity, however, in the system of care work is that um, once we understand the goals clearly, it's super clear and compelling that we have to use the MOU as the architecture. And again, I've pointed out in the previous slide where those domains, where the domains of readiness can be supported by your MOU. Next slide. You're gonna hear from uh, Ventura uh, uh, in a few minutes uh, where they're doing some really um, thoughtful um, early planning and design work and where they've got a kind of a legacy of prevention work. Um, but in addition to that, or as a precursor to that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of other county examples of things I'm familiar with where, um, where this uh, interagency um, leadership process, uh, the system of care work uh, is, is forming a, a connective supportive tissue, if you will, to the good comprehensive prevention planning process. Here on the left of this slide, you'll see represented a, a partial list of related prevention work. If you use these, if you look at these smaller circles around the large um, blue comprehensive prevention plan, I've tried to represent here just a smattering of uh, initiatives that are either historic or, or pending or new that also have prevention as a focus in some way, shape, or form. So I'll give you a chance to ponder just for a second on those elements. And some of these might be very unfamiliar to you, right? Uh, if you're not in the um, the education world, you may not know what a good student attendance review board does in your county. And it may not be a SARB process that results in good prevention work, but it's it's supposed to, right? So uh, just one example, and we're gonna dig into some others here in a, in a couple of minutes. The reality as uh, I think uh, Kush stated early on is that we're doing good prevention work in many, many ways, but we often are serving the same families and we don't even know it. Um, and so we're spending dollars uh, in ways that are um, inefficient, um, and, uh, and ineffective. So let's advance um, the slides again and take a look at a few examples of where the interagency work is connecting. Um, the first is our, uh, our friends in Santa Clara, where there is uh, about a decades long conversation that they know as CAST or Cross Agency Services Team and, and related initiatives, um, a single system of support and neighbor to neighbor. There's a number of programs at work in Santa Clara County where they have recognized in the early consideration of family first prevention services planning and implementation that they're going to build on all that legacy, right? So they're not going to start from scratch. They're going to go back and, and build on the relationships that they have in place already, the data that's available, all of the hard work they've done in Santa Clara to already approach prevention in a more comprehensive way and start the CPP planning process um, based upon that legacy. What they're planning to do is use their interagency leadership process. They call it the Executive Advisory Committee, EAC here for short. It's gonna serve as the linkage in what they're planning to do. And they've already drafted a, a matrix, a, a, a three-page document that has the initiatives in it that's gonna identify links and redundancies and data sharing opportunities. So they've already started this analysis of where the CPP planning process is gonna build on the historic process. In that executive advisory committee, they're gonna have regular and consistent reporting and monitoring to that group of their shared accountability and for plan adaptation. So they're gonna use this as the regular monthly clearinghouse. And that group meets um, twice a month at the moment. Um, they're gonna use that group as the, um, the body that's gonna vet and hear and support and, and help um, move the plan along. Uh, ultimately, uh, that executive advisory committee in Santa Clara either includes people with lived experience uh, uh, or will soon be adding tribal voices in a more, um, more active and assertive way. One more look at Santa Clara here in the next slide, just graphically, um, the same information, but just kind of a, a, a chronology, if you will, um, starting with their cast work. And you'll see they folded into this graphic, which we're, we're borrowing with their permission this morning, um, some of the other uh, implementation work of the last decade. Uh, including the continuum of care work. And I've highlighted here in the third to last bullet on the right where this system of care 
approach, this AB 2083 interagency work is going to begin to anchor as they move into good uh, comprehensive prevention planning. That's a quick look at, um, at Santa Clara. Um, in the next slide, I want to share with you um, what I think is just a remarkable um, level setting and, and, um, uh, and framing for system of care-based prevention. Our friends in Sacramento County, I know we have a couple of them here with us this morning, um, two, two plus years ago, set out as the first endeavor under the 2083 work to, to, to craft a, memorandum, a memorandum of understanding, right? Each of us, uh, each of our counties are obligated to that now. And I've, I've just lifted some of the excerpts from that because the language here is very, very powerful. So as you ponder on these quotes from their memorandum, just note particularly the underlying, the underlying sections where the visionary um, foresight of the leadership team in Sacramento could see this day coming, right? And thought, well, let's, let's anticipate uh, family first prevention services and, and comprehensive pre prevention planning. And let's put this front and center in our memorandum of understanding. So I'm gonna give you just about 10 or 15 seconds to ponder on some of these quotes and just, just, um, just feel the power and see the, the power in locating within your memorandum the, um, um, the, the power of prevention. Towards the end of my presentation, we're gonna come back to Sacramento and share um, a little bit about how they're charting some measurement around prevention and other related uh, system of care processes. But this is a quick look at some of the elements of their MOU. All right, let's explore now for a moment in the next slide, uh, some of the other points of connectivity between the system of care work and how it helps you be ready for a good comprehensive prevention plan. I've listed here again, some of the same uh, reform work or implementation initiative, prevention initiatives that are existent uh, within your county architecture. Um, the, these, each of these has dollars associated with it. And if you look at this list, these are almost all state monies. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, each of these then can be part and parcel of a matching matrix, right? You can identify, how these will be, how these will function as certified public expenditure for your federal dollars, be it Medi-Cal or the waived FFPSA dollars under 4E. And in order to do that well, because each of these dollars comes through your partnerships, in order to do that well, you're gonna to have to pull your local fiscal managers and analysts into an engaged relationship with each other in order to do the forecasting, planning, contracting work, right? If this is really synchronistic and integrated, those fiscal folks have to be in regular conversation with each other and they have to understand each other's systems enough in order to be able to blend it and braid it. Highly technical work to blend money, right? It's very difficult to do, but it's necessary. The big impetus to blending the money is that it's where the sustainability will come from because ultimately every funding source in my 35 years has gone away or been reduced on some point, at some point. It's, it's inevitable. But when we're blending and braiding, those reductions and those ebbs and flows in funding are far more navigable because you've got other resources in your sandbox to help you with that. It's a quick look at why, um, um, how the system of care can help you support the fiscal modeling for your readiness. And in the next slide, we'll look at, uh, for a minute here about the data. Um, the, the reality here is that there's a rich source of data in uh, your partnership that will inform the domains, not just of collaboration and governance, but program design, service quality, obviously the outcomes, uh, your information systems automation and your reporting requirements. And what I've listed here uh, for your consideration are five again of what are probably um, maybe two dozen, right? If you do a full inventory of the various initiatives where there are prevention resources and energies in your county, um, there'll probably probably at least 24 or 25 of these in, in most counties in California, but here are six. Uh, and we're going to explore a couple of these in some detail. Um, and feel free if you can identify other prevention work in addition to these, uh, throw it into chat um, for, for folks to look at. Um, but we're going to explore a little bit about mental health services planning for just a second. 
And then we're going to talk in some detail about some data efforts or opportunities within the local control accountability process, but there are others. Each of these processes in your county has data available that can inform your um, comprehensive prevention plan. That's the point. And, and you got to be in partnership to be able to go get that data, right? All right, so let's dig into a couple of these in some detail in the next slide. The mental health services planning, your county mental health plan, your behavioral health services department or division has obligations for regular reporting to the Department of Healthcare Services. Um, and within that process, um, what's, what, what always catches my eye is there's an expectation uh, for uh, a needs and problems identification that, allow, that requires the mental health plan to tell the state, oh, how will the program uh, that we're funding, that we're paying for, how will the services we're delivering um, address at least one of the seven negative outcomes defined in code in California? And th those seven elements are listed here on the, on, the, on the right. And so there's data in your county mental health plan somewhere, or they sh there should be, that will inform how, how their services are being delivered to support care to um, young people, children, youth, families in your community. And if you look at um, two, three, four, five, six on this list, those are all kind of like lead measures into, lead outcomes into child abuse and neglect, right? And then of course, number seven is the removal of children from the home due to abuse and neglect by itself. So six of these seven elements have direct um, uh, implication and connections to uh, child abuse uh, and neglect, which is the target, if you will, or the focus of FFPSA. Next slide. That's a quick look at the mental health services planning. Let's dive quickly into local control accountability planning. There is a process uh, there where local education authorities underneath what they call LCAP, right, a local control funding formula um, is obligated to chase data. And there's a rich data source available here. It's in DataQuest. And uh, I think we can drop that into chat um, for you. Uh, but it's a public facing domain and uh, there's a rich font of data there. And you can see I've outlined here that the, the, the LCAP requires your county office of ed or your local education authority to, to have this data as part of their plan. And it has to be updated every year. It's a triennial plan that has to be updated every year. So DataQuest is a rich source. And uh, next slide, looking at for, in further detail at that, um, you can see within the LCAP plan, um, your education partners have data on the frequency of the supports that are available in the school environment and the number of agencies in the community that can support the school in its LCAP plan. And I've lifted from... Uh, the state expectations for LCAP planning, uh, four of the required um, elements for reporting. And these to me just scream uh, family first prevention services planning data, right? So the data is out there. You don't have to go chase it uh, far and wide. It's available right under your fingertips. And uh, just pointing out here that, that these four data points in particular support your approaches to equity and access built in the long-standing approach that our school and education partners have had towards um, impacting uh, English learning students, right? So there, again, more connectivity uh, and support for addressing your um, over-representation or under service, if you will. All right, next slide. I promised we'd come back to Sacramento County and want to just give you a quick look. What I've done here is, um, this is a long story, which we don't have time for today, which we can explore in another Time, but Sacramento County has taken a very thoughtful and innovative approach to measuring their collective impact. And by its nature, it's um, pretty sophisticated and, um, and rich. And what I've lifted from uh, a developing um, document, uh, a dashboard, if you will, of outcomes in, within their system of care work are some of the elements. Uh, Sacramento County's interagency leadership folks have come together over the last year and developed um, a sophisticated dashboard. And you can see in some of these data elements that they are going to track, they will be tracking, um, the, the data points that, will, that would hypothetically and realistically inform uh, your prevention plan, both the readiness and the ultimate planning and reporting, right? The, the reporting of your CPP in the years subsequent to implementation, it would be enriched by these kinds of data points. 
So having a collective platform of um, outcomes monitoring further prepares you again, not just for readiness implementation, but for adapting your CPP down the road, which will be, um, of course, super important. All right, next slide. Um, as we kind of begin to wind down um, uh, here, uh, the, sorry, let's go one back one more slide, yeah. So I wanna point out really quickly that uh, each of these bullets comes from 35 years worth of research uh, in, in integrated work for kids and families. This comes from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. The good folks at SAMHSA have studied interagency public services for kids in multiple jurisdictions, many states and many counties for four almost four decades. And if you look at these outcomes, these are CPP outcomes, right? Like this is what we want to have accomplished by, by good family first prevention services and comprehensive prevention, prevention planning. The point here is obvious. If we do interagency work effectively, we're going to get the kind of outcomes that we're anticipating and hoping for under CPP. And there's more available in um, in SAMHSA research. If you get if you're interested in this, um, we're happy to share that with you. Another point. Next slide. As you engage your uh, interagency leadership team, uh, some critical questions to ask uh, as as you go there is you know what are the first steps needed uh, for partners to begin the planning process. Um, how will we coordinate that planning process? Do we need, uh, how will we use a theory of change logic model? Uh, do we capture this in a strategic plan? Is it a project management tool of some kind? Obviously, you've got to capture this as Kush referenced earlier, um, and the ILT should be the governing body where you have that conversation. We've talked about how uh, getting fiscal managers together, obviously. A critical question around how do we inventory our prevention services? Uh, and so the ILT is really the body to do that. And wh where's the data, right? Um, lots of abbreviations on this slide. System improvement plan, county self-assessment. Most of you know what that is. Your probation partners have data potentially in a Juvenile Justice Crime Prevention Act report. We've talked about the local control accountability plan, the Mental Health Services Act. Your public health partners under um, uh, maternal child health have data, right? We didn't talk about that this morning, but there's data everywhere. Ultimately, how will the comprehensive prevention plan impacts be measured? This is the overarching question for your ILT. In the last slide, some very quick recommendations for you. Um, just ensure that your ILT or its designated management entity is meeting frequently and supportively. One of the foundational and sometimes fatal flaws of good system of care work is that the executive body says, we're gonna meet once a year, twice a year, quarterly, won't get it done. Right. So use FFPSA CPP planning as a way to um, uh, catalyze a more frequent and consistent interagency body for your system of care more broadly. I would make um, CPP planning, family first planning, a standing agenda item on my ILT agenda every single time they come together. It's front and center. Use um, your uh, again fiscal managers. Make sure they're connected because the the dollars here are critical, uh, and and uh, sustainability won't be had without them. Uh, we've talked about um, how, how we can use data, um, but make sure that, um, that all of those data sources are being tapped as you, as you begin your planning process. Ultimately, if you don't choose your ILT as kind of your overarching body of governance uh, and collaboration building, you'll need clear and consistent linkages to it anyway. And so just make sure that they're connected in some way, even if you decide to, to use your, your CAPC or your uh, prevention cabinet or some other body as your ultimate um, prevention oversight um, planning board. Um, let me share my screen here and we will get to our next presentation. Um, this is, this is a, this is a presentation by a collaborative group at Ventura County. I think Richard sort of spoke about the legacy they have of, of building, uh, of working on prevention, but they've, they've been able to frame, like th their language has been really powerful. Um, and, you know, not that I'm sure you'll hear about the challenges along the way, but, you know, Richard gave you sort of a, okay, here's what you should consider. Here are the things to think about. And here's an example of a county that has taken that, those kinds of recommendations and information and turned it into actual collaboration on the ground. And they're going to share with you how that's gone and what they're working on now and where they're headed. So, I'm going to turn it over to 
Ventura County and David Swanson Hollinger, I believe you are speaking first. I am, thank you, Tush, and, and thank you everyone for, for having me here. Again, I'm, I'm David Swanson Hollinger. I'm with the Ventura County Human Services Agency, uh, Children and Family Services Department within that agency, and also am the co-chair of the state's uh, Prevention and Early Intervention uh, Committee of the Child Welfare Council with co-chair with our next presenter, actually, Kathy Eisenhower, um, as well as the co-chair of the uh, Family First Prevention Services Advisory Committee. So you know, excited to be talking about our local work, but also excited about the, the partnership that the state is is establishing as well with, with stakeholders at, at all levels. And, and as Kush mentioned, we're gonna try to give you a picture of, of what we're doing locally and the work that we are doing in Ventura to build our system of care and approach this work as a full continuum, as, as a full continuum that serves children and families. And, and we're calling this, you'll see in the title, a child, youth and family wellness system you know, I had, to, I had to laugh when Richard gave his analogy around dancing because I, you know, you don't want to see me dance, but I love that analogy. And and I, hopefully what you're going to see here is an example of, of we also what we also call zooming in and zooming out. So some of the specifics of how we've tried to move this work forward in the zooming in aspects, but also stepping back and looking at some of the adaptive elements that, that Dana mentioned, some of the, the, the more difficult elements that we've wrestled with as we've as we move this work forward. And I will also just whoop, go back. I want to introduce our other peers. I do want to also note as we go forward, we are in an exciting position in our county. We have a tremendous level of leadership, you know, in a way that I haven't seen in my 14 years at the county, at the executive level and at the deputy level, which is helping to move this work forward. And as we'll talk about, I think there's a lot of other elements in our system that are really positioning us. So I will quickly introduce each panelist and they'll come on at different points in the presentation. Cheryl Fox is a member of our interagency leadership team. She's also the uh, children's chief for the behavioral health department in our county. Salida Dabrowski is on our uh, child abuse prevention council board. She's also part of our prevention collaborative, which we call the Essentials for Childhood Ventura County, uh, both the steering committee for that and, and the collaborative. And then Jackie, Flores Ortega is one of our key parent leaders in the work that we're doing. And, and I think her voice will be really powerful in this work. She's also part of our prevention collaborative um, and, and our CAPSI as well. And I do wanna note when we were asked to do this, any one of us could have done this presentation alone, but I think it's really important that we are modeling what we're talking about here. And so that is why we're coming here as a team because we wanna model that cross system, that integrated approach to this work. So next slide. Okay, so you have the agenda here in front of you and, you know, it's laid out here, but essentially I want to start with you know, what got us to where we are now, and some of the foundational work that has happened in our county, the, the why, and this is really that cross systems why, the lens that this is not about child welfare or behavioral health or public health, this is around integration and around trying to build a wellness system. And then the how, we're going to hopefully illustrate to you some of those milestones which we have met, some of those things we're still trying to figure out, and at least the direction we're going in. I think, again, I will say this multiple times, This is there's a technical aspect to this, but so much of this is about adaptive change and about shifting the culture and the approach, and hopefully some of the, the how will, we'll talk about that. And with that, I do want to turn it over to Salida, and I do want to make a plug that it's very intentional that Salida is here as a representative from public health, because I think there is a tremendous amount we can learn in this work from the public health sector. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a public health person as well. You know, public health gets this. They, they've they been doing prevention. They've been doing upstream stream work for forever. And and I do think that's a critical aspect of, of the partnership as we move forward. And with that, Salida, you are up. Next slide. Thank you so much, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here. As David said, I'm with Public Health, also board president for Child Abuse Prevention Council and have been for a really long time. And so um, if you have not been to Ventura County, we invite you to come visit us. We live in the most amazing place. And I'm going to give a little bit of um, you know, just kind of a highlight, a little context about what our county looks like um, so that it can, you know, set the stage for, for the rest of our conversation this morning. So 
what you see right here is just kind of an overview of our county and how it compares to California. And so you've got, you know, number of births per year, how many under five, things like that. So in the middle column is our county. Um, you see California as well, so you can see how we compare. And then also we've pulled out a particular uh, neighborhood in our community that we want to spotlight it as well. And we want to show the difference between this one particular neighborhood in our county versus California versus Ventura County as a whole. So we, um, this particular community is in our Ox city of Oxnard. And I really want to show that last row, the poverty rate. And you can see in Ventura County, we have a very diverse uh, community. And so our, our at or below poverty rate being at 7.9 compared to California's 11.8. Then you look at this one community where it is over 21%. This is one neighborhood. This is one neighborhood that has 14,569 people in it, um, that they have this higher poverty rate. So the reason why we look at these things is because one, it allows for our prevention plan as we move forward and as we're planning this, that we can have a universal approach in our prevention plan, but also that we can really zoom in and look at particular neighborhoods. Um, and this is this is a striking um, you know, comparison that we can look at. Next slide, please. All right, so um, in, in talking about our, you know, being able to zoom in and zoom out, um, Ventura County had, we had a countywide citizen review panel for many years. And, you know, as Richard kind of, you know, alluded to, and David's alluded to, and Kush, we've been at this for a really long time. We've come a long way. We have a lot to learn. Um, and things that we are still learning, but the comprehensive prevention planning work has been going on for quite some time. So part of what our citizen review panel did was really zoom in on those zip codes where we noticed that our data was showing high rates of referrals and removals from the child welfare system. That's kind of where everybody looks. Where are the hot spots in our county? And this shows kind of our five um, zip codes where we were seeing the highest number of removals 50% of child welfare removals and 60% of our children birth to five. So, you know, really looking, and this is 2015, 2016 data, but really the trend hasn't, hasn't changed much. So our citizen review panel was really looking at this data, really diving in, um, kind of finding out what is it about these particular zip codes that we're missing? Why is this happening here? So we really have used that data to inform our efforts at a you know, smaller micro level, as well as a larger macro level. We're also building on our past processes. And I'm so glad that David called out public health. We love our data in public health, obviously. Um, we love to really get in there and look what, what's currently happening in our community. Um, and what can we do about it? What's working well and what's not? So public health, we are proud to actually be leading a very comprehensive and a multi-agency collaborative effort on shared data. Um, with an emphasis on, you know, on, on governance, bringing everybody together so that we have this united um, front to be able to take data like this and work together across systems. So we're currently working on a community information exchange. Public health is, uh, you know, at the, at the head of that currently working across a, you know, multi-agencies, you know, our hospitals and community-based partners and um, lots of different groups are working together on this. And the whole point is to be able to, to better serve our families in our county. No wrong door approach. We want families to get into services, all the services that they need, um, and that we can share data across systems and across programs and really increase our collaborative efforts. And also, you know, eventually this will this will be set up very well to support other efforts too, like CalAIM, for example. So we're already really looking at how do we bring all of these different partners to the table using data that we have at our fingertips to better serve the families in our community. Next slide, please. So as many of you probably are seeing as well, um, we really are seeing a similar disproportionality and disparity across our systems. This is not just a child welfare um, situation. We see the same families in our criminal justice um, system, in our education and early education systems, with parenting and childcare, 
um, with our health, mental health, substance abuse, you know, with our families that are experiencing poverty, this is, you know, we see this across our systems. Our goal is thriving families. That's what we want to see. That's what all of us across these systems want to see. As I always jokingly tell David, we want to put child welfare out of business. We want to really get in there and serve these families, provide them with the supports that they need um, across all these systems so that they can thrive. That is our goal. So when you look at these different systems, you know, from the public health perspective, um, looking at social determinants of health is critical in this work, really looking at what is it that is impacting these families or, or causing barriers for them um, to be able to thrive. Evidence-based programs, for sure. Those are really, really critical, again, to being able to, to wrap around and support our families. And so again, using that data um, and the data integration, looking at uh, uh, community information exchanges, how can we all work to, together more collaboratively coming to the table across systems so that we can keep our families out of these systems. We want to be able to see our families thrive. So with that, I want to turn it over to Jackie Flores Ortega. I have had the honor and privilege of working alongside Jackie for uh, 14 years. We have figured out um, in the Child Abuse Prevention Council world, and I'm excited that she's here to join us. She has um, in my opinion, the best perspective on how prevention systems can work. Um, and so I'd like to turn it over to Jackie so you can hear a little bit more about her and her story. Next slide, please. Thank you, Salida. Um, yes, it has been uh, an amazing 14 years uh, working with Salida. Um, and it's an honor to be here today on behalf of the Parent Voices in Ventura County. Um, before I get into the slide, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a background on um, how I got here today. Uh, so I'm going to give a try to be brief <laughs> in my story. But um, so uh, after having my firstborn son at, the, at such a young age, I struggled with postpartum depression. I have very little memory of my firstborn as a baby. I reached out for help and got an assistance. I received cash aid through welfare and subsidized childcare through child development resources. I felt guilt, I felt shame, and I felt useless. I took a couple of courses at the Ventura College to gain knowledge as a parent. Through the Welfare to Work program, I began an internship with the Partnership for Safe Families, the Child Abuse Prevention Council for Ventura County. I found it really interesting that the place that I was doing my internship was linked to so many of the agencies that I was receiving services from, but it was also, um, showing me so many more resources that I was able to use. I didn't, I didn't know at that time what resilience was, but I realize now how resilient I was, or I am. I didn't realize it then, but I know now that I showed strength uh, in asking for help because I needed it. I didn't understand then how important it was to have my family be there for me, to support me, but I know now that they were my social connections. By taking classes, I was feeding my knowledge of child development Well, I was also learning about the social emotional competence of my now four kids. Everything I experienced, everything I did was what I later learned to be tools known as the five protective factors. I was hired at the Partnership Child Abuse Prevention Council as the community outreach specialist, but began participating in parent trainings parent conferences and parent convenings, cafes. I had always been told I was a leader, but I never really understood uh, how. I most recently, I participated in a leadership program with a number of other leaders from part, um, partnering agencies uh, called On The Verge, uh, which is a leadership program funded through the Office of Child Abuse Prevention, uh, and it supports growth and community leaders. In the process of finding my voice, my reason, and my purpose, I learned that many parents have lived experiences in so many different stages of life. I have not navigated through the child welfare system personally, but I have helped parents navigate some of the same resources that helped me through some challenging situations. And with that being said, um, this is what led to what we call our core team. Our core team consists of a group of parents who, uh, or who are parents who have uh, lived experiences through the various systems. Our core team meets monthly. 
and um, uh, just to stay aligned within the different, what we call meaningful engagement opportunities. Uh, one of those meaningful engagement opportunities is our parent social connections, which uh, are parent led and for parents and families just to come uh, have the opportunity to, to learn uh, knowledge about various uh, topics, uh, learn about resources in our community. Um, it also provides the families an opportunity to uh, just um, provide um, insight into the different systems. At these meetings, we offer prizes to uh, to all our participants to sell, just to help celebrate our, our, our parents. Uh, one of the other meaningful engagement opportunities uh, that our core team participates in is, uh, like David mentioned, the uh, Essentials for Childhood Ventura County, which uh, are full collaborative. Uh, we also participate in the bi-monthly um, steering committee meetings to help design and co-lead, which helps our collaborative efforts. Um, okay, and then I'm excited to show you on the next slide what we call our parents' voice quilt. And I think that we were gonna be able to get a bigger picture. I'm not sure if that's possible, but I can we're gonna drop a, We're gonna drop a link to it, Jackie, so they can see they can see the whole thing while you're presenting on it. Great, and perfect. There it is, it just got dropped. Thank you. Um, so I'm excited to show you a nice clean image of the parents' voices quilt, which envisions and brings to life the purpose for not just the parents' voices, but the partnerships capsi, partnership capsi. You will see on the outside the different CBO, the community-based organizations. These are just a few of the services that have not just helped me, but a lot of the parents that are on our core team. Uh, inside that, you'll see the different lived experiences that some of the core, uh, some of our core members have. Uh, in the center, you'll see uh, some of the meaningful engagement opportunities that our core team participate in. And with that, I just want to say that. This is what a wellness system looks like to me. It's the collaboration, it's the broken silos, it's the teamwork, it's exactly what we're doing right now. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Shell Fox. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Salida, and thank you, David. It's great to be here with all of you today. Um, I was sharing with the group that I've had the honor of working for Ventura County Behavioral Health for about 25 years. And um, this has just been sort of the water we swim in. Um, and this is a phenomenal opportunity to really memorialize and create a legacy going forward of how we work on behalf of children and families and um, just really want to go ahead and just thank you for the opportunity to be here and share with you some of some additional insights that might be useful. So next slide. All right. So as you can see the child, youth, and family um, wellness perspective is really our vision in how we're going to go forward on this system. And we're really looking at aligning government, our county, the community, and stakeholders to max maximize wellness. Like Jackie was saying, that wellness center is that entire quilt to impact the children, the quality of lives for children, families, and making sure they have a safe, healthy environment, they're educated, and have a sense of belonging, purpose, and opportunity to really achieve their aspiration. As you can see, we really want to call out, you know, that intentionality within behavioral health, and we can't do it alone. It's those partnerships 
and really looking at bringing that in alignment together as we serve our community, the children and the families. What we really get this opportunity to see is their shared families, their sh with our shared values and leadership. And really, as Jackie was pointing out, that social emotional competency, right? Empowering families to have what they need at the right time. And that really comes in to alignment with many of the other initiatives as Richard spoke to. And this is an opportunity to really look at one of the current initiatives, which is Cal AIM and that continued expansion. Next slide, please. So our theory of change is really, if we align our systems and community partners to integrate for children, families, and the community, then children and families will have equitable access, as Salita pointed out, continued support and wellness opportunities, and we really wanna strengthen and protect families. Decreasing all of the system, formal system involvement, and increasing wellness overall. So we're really looking to increase access to supports and wellness, increasing alignment across our systems and continuing to strengthen those protective factors. And as we've noted, a lot of those, um, you know, system involvement, we can prevent that as we strengthen our, our alliances across agencies. Next slide. So how do we do that? So in order to really strengthen those alliances, we've got to go from having our individual agency purposes in our silos to really aligning and integrating our continued view. And we know that in order to build that wellness system, that our um, our MOU together across our agencies was really key to that. Sorry, I've got a little cold here. So, so we're moving from those silos into integration, and you know, this is the opportune time. Really looking at our workforce challenges. You know, how can we maximize our services to youth and their families and at the same time continue uh, to move forward? So aligning those approaches across all of our agencies, HSA, the child welfare system, probation, our offices of ed, all of our CBOs, that includes Tri-Counties Regional Centers, Public Health, and many, many others, including law enforcement, really engaging in the community in a preventative way. And we wanna to continue to build that legacy and a structure for ongoing integration. Next slide. So with that, our wellness system elements are really looking deeper into that cross-system leadership and shared governance. As I was sharing, I'm fairly new in this role in youth and family and the opportunities to collaborate across our agencies and across our county have been phenomenal. I think we lost Cheryl. Yeah, do you want, David, do you want to just take us through we to get Cheryl gets her audio? Oh, wait. really move into that data sharing. Uh, some of you may have seen our, our recent 
Uh, hey, folks, we apologize. We know Cheryl's having some audio issues. We're gonna we're gonna have Dave, David. We're gonna have you step in for for a moment here. Um, good thing any one of you could have given this presentation. <laughs> hey, we are flexible. We'll make this work. And Cheryl, sorry about the technical issues. And and you can see. I mean, you you all can read the the different elements of this this Lego diagram. Um, you know, for those of you from San Diego and your Lego land, and and for anyone that's participated in breaking barriers and that collaborative, this this is lifted directly from that work. It's a it's a another element uh, or another aspect of some really exciting collaborative work that's happening. And and I think all four of these elements, Richard, I it touched on them in his presentation in different ways, and and you know the governance, the data sharing, the the community family engagement, and the fiscal elements are all critical elements in moving this work forward. And so we're, we're, we really attempted to elevate those for our ILT and our other cross system partners to put them in the forefront as we, as we move the work forward. And so hopefully some of that will come out in, in the following slides as well. Okay, we can move forward. I think I'm picking up the next slide anyway. Okay, so this is a path, a roadmap, and I'm not gonna go through every one of these elements and we could probably put another different eight or 10 elements and any of you in counties probably have a number of different uh, initiatives or, or efforts that have happened. But I think what, what we're really trying to do here is illustrate the path and the foundation that that water we swim in, as Cheryl said, that that has been a long history of our work in, in a cross system way. And, and many of these are, are familiar to, to different folks, definitely those in child welfare, this will look very familiar. Um, I do wanna call out two of them though, two, two three total, but two examples. One is the citizen review panel and Salida gave some, some data from that and talked about that process. And I, what I think is really important just to re-emphasize that is the use of data to illustrate where we have you know, pockets of disproportionality and pockets of disparate outcomes across systems. It, it's, it, it was the beginning of us being much more intentional of, in our county in a cross-system way of looking at where we have equity challenges, where we have, have need to be very focused and intentional in, in our work in certain communities that, that tend to not fare as well across, as you saw, across all of our systems and, and the data that when we presented those, those data across the different systems were powerful across all of the different partners. An example of where what we're now trying to do with some of that, the one example is the Neighborhoods for Learning and Wellness down there. This is an effort led by First Five in partnership with other community, early childhood community organizations to go in and do some early prevention work. And I'm gonna talk about that term in a minute, but do some early work at a, at a perinatal level with families, you know, way before they would ever be visible to my system, the child welfare system. Um, so it's so it's an example of now starting to use that data in a in an intentional upstream way. The other example I want to highlight here is PASS, and I know it's that acronym Priority Access to Services and, and Supports. This is a partnership that we established. It was under the the auspices of the Child Welfare Council several years back, and it was a partnership between child welfare, behavioral health, both on the adult side, both their specialty mental health. Uh, system for adults, as well as the um, alcohol and drug program, as well as our primary mental health partners. In, in our case, it was Beacon uh, Health Options does our primary mental health care to ensure and establish a system and a process for expedited within uh, five days access for parents entering the child welfare system to behavioral health system uh, services that would be that would be needed by them. And we were able to make that happen, which was a pretty significant system level change and that then set the foundation for us to do something similar on the children's side. So for several years now, all children entering the child welfare system have had automatic universal expedited access to behavioral health services, which is we think has had a very much, a very strong impact and contributing impact in our dramatic reduction in congregate care uh, number levels within our, our county and placement disruption. That's the kind of foundation we wanna use as we look at at entry for families in our prevention system and our development of the community pathway. So it's that kind of work that we wanna be able to build on uh, going forward. Next slide, please. 
so this illustrates things that some elements that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, and I, I, I want to just elevate them because they are significant uh, factors and drivers in our county. The, the first block are changes that are happening in the environment and the, and the way that we're serving families. And so we have seen a dramatic reduction in separation of families um, and removal of children from their parents, both in the child welfare system as well as in the juvenile justice system and, and uh, young young uh, youth that are being detained. And so that has had a significant impact and a lot of that effort has been because we've been trying to work more upstream uh, with, with families. You know, that second one relates also to the juvenile justice system, moving away from criminalizing behavioral health challenges. We often are working in a cross system way with families that have significant challenges and haven't yet touched the child welfare system, but families are struggling with youth with, with unmet behavioral health needs. And so we've really tried to lean into how to, to leveraging our collective efforts to support those families. Some exciting work on the behavioral health and, and school partnership level with development of wellness centers with, with a goal ultimately of having wellness centers in, in every high school in, uh, in our county. And then just the role of public health and communities. I mean, if COVID didn't do it, nothing's, nothing's going to. And public health is, you know, I think people are finally understanding the value and the critical uh, role that public health has in, in the community. Um, you know, overall that I think is, is that all of this again, touches on that equity lens and, and the use of the data to support that work. And it also coincides with, with the changes that are happening at the state level and the national level you know, around, around prevention. On that second set of, of bullets, this is where some of the adaptive work comes in. And you, know, you can see some of the technical elements there, but I think it all has started with, with the effort to help identify collectively what's in it for all of us. You know, I come in from a child welfare lens. I want families to not come into my system. But when I say prevention in my system, that means something different to Salida and something different to Jackie and something different to Cheryl. And so there's been a lot of work to find that collective why for all of us. And that's been very intentional. That's why we're calling this a wellness system, not a child abuse prevention system. You know, we're really looking at how can we promote wellness? How can we promote resiliency in families? And if we do that, we're going to promote, we're going to prevent entry into all kinds of different systems. So that's been very intentional as well. And some of the, the other elements is in doing this, it's forced us to get past our silos, to get past our jargon, to get past our our frames of reference that we that we've always had and our regulations that allow certain things and realize, you know, a lot of times there's more flexibility in there than than we really thought there thought there was. So it's that that's and that's the work that's hard. And we're not there yet, but we I think we've made tremendous strides in the last several years in, in doing that. Next slide, please. This is an example, and, and I know Richard touched on this, and there'll be another slide that provides some more detail, but just some of the building blocks, some of the elements in our wellness system, and, and there are others that we're still talking about and trying to figure out how to, to effectively integrate. But it, it starts with our interagency leadership team, and we have a, a powerful group of leaders. They meet monthly. It includes agency heads from the Human Services Agency, as well as our child welfare director, uh, probation, behavioral health, also uh, uh, the head of our regional center and our superintendent of our office of education. And we've also included uh, an executive level represent representative from our healthcare agency. And so that is bringing in as well, the public health perspective and the ambulatory care perspective uh, into the discussions, which is, which is so critical. The operations group you see there is essentially a deputy level group that is steering the implementation of the 2083 MOU that Richard talked about. And I'll talk a little more about some of the specifics of that. But you know, operationalizing that is, is a tremendous amount of work. And so that's the group that's steering it. Um, the E for C, the Essentials for Childhood, that is our prevention collaborative and is a broader group that includes First Five and our, our uh, child uh, resource referral, uh, child care entity. And, uh, healthcare and a number of other entities, as well as most of our, all of our ILT partners. And I'm not going to go through each of those, but, but you can see all of those are, are really critical. I do want to call out, I mean, we're talking about prevention here, but critical in this is what we can learn from the work we're doing around complex care. So that is intentionally in there because these are some families that are already in the child welfare system, some families that have very complex needs, and we're trying to avoid that. So 
you know, I think there is alignment with, with those travel for folks that are, I know, very much wrestling with, with those challenges right now. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a little bit more detail of that last slide. And this is, you know, draft should be on there about four different times. This is an initial attempt that we have be, we have made, and this was done uh, when was it, back in September prior to some, some work I'm going to talk about that happened at the Board of Supervisors uh, last month. But this is an attempt to begin to, to codify, to develop a formal structure uh, around this process. And so you see the dotted lines there are infrastructures that are not yet in place. So we've talked about the idea of a wellness, child and family wellness commission that would include those elements in that box. And there, there's a lot of detail here. You can obviously see this when you, when you pull up the PowerPoint on your own. I won't go through all these specifics, but I do want to call out a couple of, of, of aspects. The community leader box on there is really important, and this is an area we're still we're still getting there on. We're still figuring out, but the the role of our community based providers that Kathy will will talk talk about way more eloquently eloquently than I can is critical, as well as those other non traditional partners, our faith based partners, and then especially our our parent and youth voice in that in that role, which is why they're they're part of that. The middle tier is beginning of us trying to align some of those those different efforts and those different um, elements of our system. And Richard, in his, one of his slides, I know, had some examples of, of different elements across systems that that could tie to this work. And so this is this is a very intentional example of us beginning to identify some of those those cross system efforts that are being led by our different agencies that that would align with this work. And then the bottom is much more specifically getting into the different initiatives um, across that continuum and and being intentional about the the need to align those initiatives um, both in terms of system alignment and integration as well as child family wellness more broadly so i will let's move on from here i know we've got just a couple more minutes next slide please One of the things that we have done recently, about a month ago now, a month and a half ago now, is elevated the work that is happening, or really been developed over the last year, year and a half, uh, of our ILT and of our cross system work to our Board of Supervisors. We felt it very important that they have visibility to this work. And so there was a presentation that was done by an integrated team of our, our full interagency leadership team. You know, all of them came in to present, which was very intentional, in, including you know, those non-county partners that, that don't normally are not at our board of, of supervisors meetings. And it, it was not an ask. You know, normally we go to the board and say, hey, we want resources, we want money. This was really more of a, this is the work that we're moving forward. We want your engagement. And without getting, what was exciting about it was the energy. It was, a, I believe we had a 90 or a 60 minute presentation booked on the board agenda because of all the engagement by the supervisors. It went on for more than 90 minutes. And then the board called a recess because a number of those supervisors wanted to come down and talk to the specific ILT representatives about, about next steps and, and where it was going. So I think it really set a stage for our future work and engagement at, at that you know, highest level within our county to move this work forward. Next step, next uh, slide, please. Another critical element is alignment of the partners in how we approach the work. And you know, many of us are familiar with the integrated core practice model. It, it is a framework that can guide our work both at the leadership level as well as at the practice level and the planning level. And we just finished last week was the end of our initial kickoff. In fact, thank you, Richard, and, and our team from Social Policy Institute in San Diego, at San Diego State for helping to move this forward. We brought in leadership, not just from the ILT and those that have been directly involved with this work, but management at all management across all of the the partner agencies in our in our wellness system. And so there was about 100 people that came in, including the executive leadership and our CEO at our kickoff, our county CEO at our kickoff, to help understand not just what an integrated core practice model is, but it was also the introduction for many of them for the first time as to our well of our wellness system. And it was done collectively in a way that very intentionally promoted partnership and communication across the different systems. And I, I think what was most exciting is seeing the energy. I mean, it was, and unfortunately I had to miss last week because I was out ill, but it was just incredible energy and excitement on the part of 
of those that participated. And I think it really, it set a fantastic foundation for our work going forward. The next steps at this point are now going to be taking this to the rest, the broader organizations within our wellness structure, as well as to our community partners and, and other agency partners uh, across the larger continuum. So that'll be the work over the next year, year and a half. Next slide, please. A few other aspects that we are looking at going forward that hopefully will help help folks that are that are taking on this work. Uh, social network analysis. This is a tool that we are taking on, and it's a way, essentially, a way to map out current levels of collaboration across our community partners. And we are going to be launching this in the next month or so. We hope this will be a tool that will help us to then identify. Okay, who who do we have strong relationships with that we can bring to the table? And who do we not have strong relationships with that we need to bring to the table? Especially those non-traditional providers that may be the ones best equipped to serve some of our, our underserved or, or disproportionately represented communities, but haven't been pulled into the work that, that often the, the county structures and systems are are driving. And that'll be, we're also gonna be focusing and continuing to use our data to look at hotspots, not just in the areas we talked about, but other areas within our county as we move forward our work and, and use that approach in our in our cross-system planning, um, build on the work that our CAPSI is already doing uh, in, in engaging community partners as well. They, they have a robust community partnership network that they already bring together, so we're gonna leverage that. And then we need those processes, and these are some of the things, Kush, you talked about, and, and you know, how do we know we're there? These are some elements, but we're not there yet. We need to get there. So we, we know we need to work on some of these other elements on the last bullet. Next slide, please. Okay, the comprehensive plan next to us, and this really ties to the, to the previous side. Um, one of the ways in which we're trying to leverage AB 2083, as, as Richard identified, there's, there's a number of different tenants in AB 2083. And we really do see those tenants as the building blocks, not just for our comprehensive prevention plan, but for all of our cross-system initiatives. And so we, we intend, and, and I think Richard, you said it quite well, we want to use those. We started with the integrated core practice model because we feel like that is, is so foundational, but we are working on shared data we're, we want to leverage, and we are beginning to leverage the, the work Salida talked about with community information exchange. Um, screening and assessment we think there's an opportunity to build on the work that first five is doing and and our uh, school wellness work in looking at our community pathway development with within our county share and then finally shared resources that's always the biggest challenge and i'm excited that our ilt it's starting at the ilt level and they are beginning some some very intentional conversations about what shared resources will look like including we've brought on actually a fiscal consultant to help us with that because that is that is pulling out of our silos is so critical, and, and understanding where we can be flexible is so critical. I, you know, I saw a question in the chat about leveraging using other funding streams to leverage 4E. That's exactly the kind of thing we're looking at. You know, first five dollar can can draw down a 4E dollar, or can draw down an EPSDT, you know, federal mental health dollar. So we're trying to look at how to be creative with with some of those those different funding streams and and identify when, when maybe things don't easily fit within any of our funding streams where it's still in our interest to have a shared commitment to support families, even though they may go beyond funding streams and, and require some discretionary funds because they make sense in the long term. And then lastly, shared communication. And that's really critical both, both vertically within the agencies as well as horizontally across agencies and across the community. So we're being very deliberate just just about to finalize a logo and, and developing some communication strategies for this work to, to move it forward in a, in a uniform way. And next slide, two more slides here. Critical elements here, relationships. This all starts with relationships. You know, the fact that I can call up anybody else, anybody in, on this team that's presenting today and, and have those difficult conversations is critical and that's, that's foundational. And it's similar to our work with families. And we, we talk about services are essential, but those services start with relationships. And it's those relationships that heal through those services. I think that's absolutely a, an analogy that applies to this, this high level work as well. That leadership engagement uh, is, is critical as well and generating that engagement and that, that common understanding, as well as the, the engagement of those that, those that we're trying to reach, you know, parents, youth, other partners, 
And I talked about the common understanding, that clear vision, and we're still figuring some of this out. You know, that whole big complicated map is, that's, that's not, that's not going to happen overnight, but pulling that together is critical and having that vision, I think will help us to pull all of that together and then building and building on those past successes, as, as we've talked about. Again, this is adaptive. You know, this is, this is slow, this is hard, but it's adaptive and it's, it's worth it for families. And last slide. So these mirror some of the things that Richard showed, and these are some of the the results that we we hope to achieve. And, and part of what we need to do is is create more more structured and more specific results or, or more um, uh, specific outcomes. But these are some of the things that we're hoping to see across our various systems: you know, family separation, access, health outcomes, et, et cetera. You know, looking at our mandated supporters, I do want to call that one out because there's a lot of work happening across the state and in looking at the role of mandated reporting and how that can be shifted to to support families that really don't have child abuse or neglect issues but but need need help and those that are reporting recognize that but don't have anywhere else to turn but the child welfare system and, and ultimately this is about equity um, to do if we're doing this right this will be, begin to address we hope and we expect that some of the disproportionality that we have seen. In our county, we have a disproportionate number of Latinx families with young children in the child welfare system and in, in many of our other systems. And, and we, want to, we want to support those families differently than we have historically. I will stop there. Thank you. And I appreciate the time and having the opportunity to share our story. Thank you so much, Ventura County. Um, really starts to become real. Right when you when you see all the recommendations um, to take hold and folks actually working through them, so we are going to send you to um, a break. And um, Jessica, I'm going to recommend that we do a three minute break just to catch up on a little bit of time. Um, and uh, so do a stretch, and then when we come back, we're going to hear from. Um, as David mentioned, uh, his co-chair of the Prevention and Early Intervention Committee and a revered um, and really fiercely advocating provider um, here in Southern California who um, has figured out a way to, to be at many tables and provide a lot of value to, to some of this connectivity work that's happening. Um, this will be recorded, so of course, any pieces you miss, um, you'll be able to listen to again, and you can share this with partners that you wish you would have had here today. So without further ado, um, I am going to share my screen and turn it over um, to Kathy Eisenhower. All right. Oh, you you're on mute, Kathy. Okay, not sure what's happening, but my mute and video button keep going on. <laughs> on. Uh, so again, I was just saying good morning. Uh, thank you, Kush, for the introduction. Uh, no, no pressure there <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, but uh, also just happy to be here this morning uh, and hopefully share some some insight. Uh, I was tasked with. Uh, this subject, engaging providers in comprehensive prevention plan. And, and Kush said, Kathy, what, what can you tell folks about engaging providers in this process? Well, you know, first of all, I think it's, it's a lot of the things you're gonna see on these slides today, they, they look very simple, but they're, they're not. And so I just wanna say that right at the beginning that I think, just like kind of you saw with Ventura's presentation, that um, engaging providers needs to be done in a very strategic and intentional manner, as uh, you'll see as, as we go through these slides. Um, because it's not just about engaging CBOs in the process, it's about engaging the right CBOs in the process that are really going to fulfill the needs of your comprehensive prevention plan, that are gonna to bring to you the services and supports that you're gonna need. And that really takes a lot of thought and planning throughout this process. So I, I think that if you can go to the next slide, kind of the first step is that you have to be clear on what your goal is for engaging providers. 
Why do you want them involved? Uh, what, what is their involvement going to accomplish for your team? You know, I, I, I know, hopefully that's not just to check off on your list that you have a CBO at the table. Um, hopefully that is for, again, the meaningful involvement of CBOs in your CPP process. Next slide, because in my opinion, CBOs, and of course I'm a little biased because I am one, um, is that CBOs bring richness to all the work that we're talking about this morning. Uh, for the most part, we're the ones that hold the services that you need. And, and we're the ones that are going to be there working with those families. We can let you know what the current barriers are. You know, and I put in here the child welfare system, but really not just the child welfare system, but the barriers that our families are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as the barriers that we face as CBOs that really block our ability to provide services in a, in a meaningful way, um, you know, regulations, requirements that uh, we could potentially streamline or consolidate or that perhaps conflict with existing processes or things you're thinking about uh, putting in place. I, I know I actively participate in LA County's planning process, and I will say that there have been numerous occasions where I've been able to step up and say, look, this doesn't align with this programmatic requirement or that programmatic requirement. So this is something that we need to take a look at. I, I think also CBOs can inform you about funding streams that are available and any other opportunities or barriers to blend or braid or use funds as a match. I know this morning we, we heard a lot about state funds that are available, potentially local funds are available, but as CBOs, we have access to other types of funding sources that we may be using in our communities that might be able to assist in your development. For example, federal grants that are going directly to CBOs in your communities that may be from SAMHSA or HRSA. Uh, you know, for, for example, um, and I should have said I'm the CEO of Shields for Families and I'm in South LA, but since 1997, I've, uh, Shields has been fortunate enough to have a Healthy Start grant from HRSA to address the high infant mortality rate amongst African-American families in our communities. So again, another extremely helpful source of funding that's coming into the community that could potentially be available as a part of your continuum of services that you're building. You know, there's also private foundation money. You know, again, a lot of resources that your CBOs might have that you may not be aware of um, from a, a county or state perspective that we may be able to offer, you know, you. Um, but I think, again, most significantly, in, in addition to the services, we are there with the families every day. You know, we can help you bring families to the table to be a part of the input. We can help you engage families in the planning. And again, we know what families want and need. And, and we can bring that information to your planning table to help inform your process. Next slide. So again, here, here is, as I was saying, I think you have to be extremely strategic and intentional about how you identify CBOs and invite them to the table. Um, I identified three steps here, identification, pre-engagement, and engagement. <clears throat> I think you can go to the next slide. The first critical piece of this is, again, knowing who it is that you want to have involved. And that goes back to that first question about what it is that you want to accomplish, what your mission is, what your vision is. You know, because again, you need providers that are going to help support that vision, help join with you in that vision, have a similar philosophical consistency with that vision, and hopefully are representative of the populations and the communities to, you plan to serve. They offer the services that you hope to incorporate based on, on data and family need. And uh, I wanna stop here and just give a couple of examples. Having provided family resource centers for over two decades in the community, 
I think that sometimes we we look at the what I would call the usual suspects when we're talking about planning or, or pulling together a continuum of care. And by that, I mean, you know, some of the, the services that are targeting family first, mental health, home visitation, um, substance abuse. Well, I will tell you in like the two decades of data that I have, you know, always in that top three or four, our families have requested legal services and material supports. And so to me, that is key in any kind of comprehensive plan that you're building. You really have to look at all the data that is out there. You've been given a lot of resources, kind of access that data from different systems. Also use your CBO's data too in this process. You know, if you have a system of family resource centers, take a look at the data that they have gathered during their work in the community to see what it is that's being requested is those are the critical things that you need to build into your continuum. You know, I, I will tell you when legal services first started popping up years ago, that one actually surprised me because I'm being honest, I, I, I didn't think about it. But it is a critical factor in, in the work that we're doing with our family. So, uh, I, I work in a community where there's a, a high immigrant population. So getting work visas is critical. Also because uh, of, you know, involvement with the criminal justice system, you know, getting, taking care of those issues. Legal, legal services was a critical factor for many, many families. So having partnerships with legal agencies, having those agencies come on site, that was has been critical to the work that we do with our families in order for them to be able to move on and have the kind of stability, be able to access vocational services, educational services, get jobs. Um, that, that was a critical piece. And so again, I really challenge you when you're taking a look at this to not just think about the, the as I say, the usual suspects. You need to make sure that, that your CBOs are geographically representative. And again, most significantly, that they're agencies that families and other service providers value and respect in your community. So if you can go to the next slide, these are just some of the factors that I feel like you should consider when you're looking at identifying the CBOs that you, 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 know, you want to work with or pull into your planning process. Again, um, what we just talked about, the types of services that they provide. Um, you know, how, how many CBOs do you want at the table? And, and what kind of the size of the CBOs? Because I think that is also critical. Um, you know, there are many small mom and pop agencies in the community that are critical to, you know, those informal networks that really support our families. And so I think you, you need to be cognizant. Uh, it was good to see what Ventura plans on doing because that is exactly what I would recommend doing. Really do a survey, really do an assessment of what is out there and then match it with your data to, to see who it is you really need to have at that table. You know, again, what Ventura is doing, there are the geographical area covered. Are there specific communities where you know you need to have services and you need to, you know, make sure that agencies are represented at your table from those communities, you know, and you're making sure that those services are built into those communities. You know, for doing this for 31 years, I'm just going to say that families do not travel, okay? They don't. And so if you are going to really bring services to families, you need to take a look at the geographical re representation of your CBOs and your services as you build them out. Because again, I, I have families, if it's more than two miles down the road, they're, they're not going to go. Um, and so again, I think you need to, to be aware of that. And then again, you know, what does that agency look like? Do their staff, are they representative of the families and communities? Do they walk like, talk like, you know, think like, are they from the community? Um, you know, when we talk, talked earlier about, you know, CBOs being able to engage with the families, well, 
many of our staff have also went through our services at one point. You know, I, I'll just say at, at Shields, for example, there's about 25% of our staff that went through our services at one point and now are employed at the agency. So they bring that lived expertise to the job and the work they do. You know, overall, like 90% of our staff are from the communities that we serve. You know, so again, these are folks that are living there, understand what the issues are. So again, I think that that is a critical factor for you to take a look at. You know, of course you have to have the providers that are offering some of those things that are critical to Family First, you know, some of the EVPs that we're talking about. But even as you're looking at them, take a look at the fact that are there already partnerships and networks within your communities that offer an array of services that perhaps incorporate some of these EVPs also? You know, are there champions in your community already? You know, are, are there CBOs that are already part of advocacy groups so that you know that they're willing to work with others, be at the table? Again, are there natural networks that exist already so that if you identify one provider, you, you actually have a whole array of service providers that are connected with them? I, again, my opinion, <clears throat> but uh, any good CBO that's advocating for family they have partnerships with other providers that are going to ensure that a family gets every service that they need. Um, and again, reputation. And with that, I, I, I would say, ask your line staff, if you're county providers, <clears throat> ask your line staff who they refer families to, who the families are willing to go to. You know, I think another key factor, which I didn't put on this list, but um, length of stay. So again, when I, I think about Families First, we're talking about working with families for a long period of time. And so what are the CBOs, what, what is their philosophy about that? Um, as well as do they involve families in their plan? Uh, is that a factor in their agency? So see if they have like a consumer advisory board or they have, you know, consumers on their board of directors, uh, because that will tell you a lot about how they already think about and plan for services. And hopefully that is consistent with your mission. Uh, and I think that, again, that's like a first step before bringing them at the table. I think you need to determine whether or not these CBOs already have a mindset about partnering and working together because mm -hmm. obviously that, as you heard, you know, throughout the presentation this morning, that's a key first step is developing those relationships, developing those partnerships that are going to help you get to your goal, to your vision, to your mission. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, now I'm giving you lots of homework to do before you ever get to the CBO. Um, because again, I think it, it is a critical part of the process. I've unfortunately been in meetings where providers have been invited, they come, but because they really had no idea of what it was that was happening, that was the one and only meeting that they attended. You know, and again, I think that this piece is critical if you want meaningful involvement. I think you need to, you know, once you've identified kind of the, the who you want to in, invite to educate yourself about that provider. Hopefully you've done that through some of this identification process, you know, but again, when I was writing this, I thought about probably many of you have been in the position where you're interviewing somebody for a position to hire them and they come in and they have not found out anything at all about your agency, you know? And so don't, I know how I feel about that. So don't go to a provider to ask them about becoming a part of your planning process if you don't know anything about them or what they do, you know? Make sure that you've taken that time to, to really look at them. Could you go to the next slide, push? And so kind of laid it out here on a chart for you. So again, I, I think that CBOs, 
most significantly. They, they need to feel like they're valued and respected. Um, you know, again, be, being honest, when you go into these meetings, I guess I have, uh, fortunately, I have some experience with the child welfare system. Uh, once upon a time, I was an emergency response worker many years ago. But if I didn't have some of that knowledge, I would be lost in some of these meetings. So I, I think that, you know, the same way back, I think it's important that you learn about their systems, you learn about them um, before you invite them to the table so that you have some understanding of where they're coming from and again, you know, what they do. And then the, the motivation for them to join. Because again, this is something that requires a lot of, of time, um, you know, a lot of work. And so what is the motivation that you can offer, the incentive you can offer that CBO to be a part of the planning process? Um, I, I know again, for many CBOs in the community, it, it is that ability to be a partner in the design of services. Um, unfortunately, right now, uh, things, in the community are not great with child welfare. Again, just being honest, been seeing that our families that are impacted by substance abuse, seeing their children being removed again immediately, uh, whether they're in treatment or not. And so that is something that is near and dear to a whole lot of folks' hearts. And so being able to be at the table to hopefully design a system where we see substance abuse and mental health as treatable issues that we can, you know, offer to families the services to support them so that they don't have to be involved with the child welfare system. You know, that in and of itself can be a critical motivation for CBOs to be at the table. You know, again, the, the barriers and, and challenges. Um, you know, again, at Shields, we, we literally have a child welfare liaison position. We have an office at the juvenile dependency courts in order to be able to advocate for our families and to CBOs. These are things that are, I believe are, are critical to be, again, able to be there to help design a system that is going to support our families in staying out of the child welfare system, the probation system, all the things that for families in my community um, are unfortunately happen on a, on a regular basis. Um, and hopefully they also, they will see that the ability to be a part of the oversight on an ongoing basis will again, give them that ability to help reimagine, you know, services for their families. Um, I think it's critical not to offer things that you can't provide, but I, I will put a plug in here because most CBOs don't have a lot of time. Um, they're overwhelmed with everything that they are required to do. And so if there is in any way um, in, in any, uh, you know, any resources to help support them for their time um, or to, you know, again, acknowledge that it is a burden on them. Um, and so to make sure that your meetings, your scheduling, your things, take, take all of that into consideration. You know, but more importantly than anything, don't don't offer what you you can't provide, and be very clear uh, upfront about what the the commitment is that you're asking for. Um, you know, their their time, their ideas, their data, um, you know, their partnership, and also the who. Um, I think it's also very critical to specify if they're coming to the table that it's somebody that really can make the decisions for that agency and um, be able to, to, if there is a critical decision that needs to be made, that they have the authority, the ability to, to make that call at the table. Next slide. And then you've heard this several times this morning, but um, that in, engagement of CBOs is it, really ultimately based on relationships. Um, you know, when, when I stop and think about it in terms of the partnerships that I have, both with government agencies and, and, and other CBOs, um, it, it's not the agency that I have a partnership with, it's, it's someone there. So it's not the Asian American Drug Abuse Program that I have a partnership with, it's, it's Dean, the CEO. 
You know, it's not personal involvement center that I have a, a partnership with, it, it's Maxine, you know? And so I think that, you know, that was brought up with in Ventura's presentation, that participation really is based on respect for each other, you know, and, and the commitment to, to work towards a shared vision or mission. Agencies don't partner, people partner. That's, I guess, what I'm saying. And so to, so in order to ensure that CBOs stay at the table, develop a relationship. Um, that's why I think that the best approach to engaging with the CBO is to personally reach out. And, you know, if, if in your collaborative, they know someone at a CBO, engage them in, in the ask, um, you know, and, and make sure that you're letting the CBO know that you did your homework, that they were selected because of what they do, their knowledge, you know, what they mean to the community and the families that they serve. And then, you know, again, this is something that I feel is critical is to prepare them for the meetings. Um, you know, th this is where us working in our little silos often gets in the way. Um, we don't recognize that, like, we may be doing all the same things. We just call them different names. And so, you know, most of your providers coming in would not know what a CFT you know, was, unless they happen to be engaged in the child welfare system, but they wouldn't know what a, a, a multidisciplinary case conference was. Uh, and so help them, I, I put it, I actually had written like a cheat sheet, help them to understand the language that's going to be used in the meeting also. Um, because uh, again, you, you want them to be able to participate and you don't want them to get lost just because folks are talking about I can't even do it now, ICLs and, and, and ACLs and, you know, they won't know what that means, you know, but you can help prepare them for the meaning so they're not lost in that process. Next slide. So again, I keep using these words over and over again, but make sure that the CBOs know that they are valued and respected, um, you know, in your ongoing meetings, make sure that they're engaged in tasks and, and given assignments um, so that they can build those relationships with other members of your team and that they feel like they, they're, they are offering something valuable to you. You know, so um, I've been engaged in multiple planning activities. I give, I don't know if LA is on the, the call, but I'll give them their props. Uh, I have been, you know, asked to be engaged in multiple planning tasks to, to lay out, you know, the pathways, the community pathway, you know, some of the other pathways that we're, we're building in the county. And I feel hurt. And, and that's what CBOs need to be able to feel. They need to be involved and they need to feel like they're heard in the process, you know, and keep checking in with them, you know, but again, keep building those relationships you know, and make sure you're listening to what folks have to say. It, you know, just like they'll have to learn your language, you know, you need to learn theirs also so that we make sure that we're on the same page. So, and Hi. that, thank you, Kush. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, so, you know, the, the location of this next presentation really illustrates the proverb, last but not least. And, and I, put, um, I put this presentation at the end. Oh, sorry, trigger happy there. I put this presentation here at the end because I hear a fair bit of hand, you know, I see a fair bit of hand wringing and anxiety and frustration that this should happen. In, in, in many of the circles where, where, where I work. And my sense is, just, you, if I knew nothing about child welfare and I just knew about implementation, that to the degree you do this well, it's gonna go smoothly. And to the degree that you're not able to engage your, the, the tribes that you know, you, you have in your communities and the ones you don't know, you have in your communities, your implementation of prevention is going to go smoothly. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jack Trope here. And, and I just want, this is one, this is one that can make or break, 
your prevention system folks. Um, so uh, without further ado, Jack. Hey, you're on mute. I have, I see a little red microphone. Oh, I said there thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. And if we can advance to the next slide. So let me start. I probably should have had a slide before this that, that uh, just gives you a little bit of background. So there are 574 federally recognized Indian tribes across the country, or tribal nations, as you prefer. Um, over 100 of those are in California. Um, there are also unrecognized uh, tribes as well, a number of whom are also in California. So uh, in terms of now, many of the tribes are small in California, but nonetheless, in terms of raw numbers, California has almost 20% of the tri federally recognized tribes in the entire country. And when you look at, at the um, self-identified American Indian and Alaska Native population in California, and I say self-identified because that's different than necessarily a member or citizen of a tribe or tribal nation, which is determined by the tribe or tribal nation, but self-identified American Indian or Alaska Native people in California, in raw numbers, it's the largest population in the country. Uh, not by percentage, obviously, but in raw numbers. So, so this is why it's important, among other things, to um, connect with the tribes uh, that, that you, the most relevant tribes for your particular county. So I just wanted to start with um, an overview of, you know, we talk about tribes or tribal nations, and what do we mean by that? Why do we have tribes or tribal nations? Well, well tribes and tribal nations were sovereign before the United States existed. Uh, before uh, uh, California ex existed as an entity, before uh, it was part of Mexico or, or uh, Spain, going back even before that, uh, tribal Indi Indian tribes had sovereignty, right? So under uh, American law, that sovereignty continues unless it's been taken away by, by treaties, by uh, congressional statute, uh, the courts of held Congress has the, the right to do that, one example is an Indian Civil Rights Act that's put certain requirements on tribes, or by the Supreme Court of the United States, or, or courts in general. Right. So obviously, tribal sovereignty is not um, uh, without limits. Uh, just like states, tribes can't make war, they can't engage in foreign relations, uh, they can't print or issue currency, and there are a variety of other restrictions unique to tribes that, that the courts or statutes have imposed. But one thing you should know is that um, uh, the Supreme Court has said, uh, in, in, and this is a 1981 case, that tribes retain their inherent power to determine tribal membership, regulate domestic relations among members, and prescribe rules of inheritance for members. So in other words, the tribe's authority in terms of its members or citizens in the domestic relations or, or child welfare area uh, is extensive. Uh, and uh, many of you know, maybe most of you know about the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, which is a law that was enacted by Congress that's imposed in state courts when uh, children who are members are eligible for membership uh, uh, are involved. That's an example, again, of, of this sort of what I'll call dual citizenship or really tri-citizenship that uh, American Indian Alaska Native, some American, uh, American Indian Alaska Native people have. They can be uh, citizens of their, their tribe or tribal nation, citizens of their state, citizens of the United States. So, um, so just be aware of that when you're thinking about tribes. That's why uh, they exist the way they do. That's why they are independent of the state of, of, of California in, in many respects. Uh, there, there was a law passed by Congress uh, that some of you may know of called Public Law 280, which provided some jurisdiction for the state over tribal communities. I'm not going to go into that in any detail. We just don't have the time. Uh, but by and large, that's why we're dealing with tribes as, as pre-existing governments that are not sub-segments or subdivisions of the state. All right, next slide, please. Um, so in Family First, tribes are specifically called out. Uh, and so uh, and in 2008, uh, the law was changed specifically to allow tribes to come in and obtain direct 
Title IV E funding uh, from the federal government. Um, there's there's also the right of tribes to come in and uh, 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 well, I'll come I'll, I think I'm going to slide on that, so I won't talk about that first. But tribes with a IV E program, right, who are running a IV E program, can include Family First Prevention Services as part of their plan, and we'll talk about how that happens. Or, or just I can include as part of their overall program. Um, HHS is required to specify the requirements and performance measures for our tribal prevention services program, and HHS must allow programs and services adapted to culture and context of the tribal community served. Now, that's uh, I'm going to sort of explain that a little more in future slides. So let's uh, move to the next slide. All right. So tribes have two ways. Tribal nations have two ways to obtain funding under 4E. One is this direct funding mechanism where tribes can uh, submit plans and just like states do, get them approved. Uh, and uh, we know out of, but out of 574 tribes, uh, only about 17 have been approved so far. Uh, there was one, one tribe that's approved um, uh, in California. Uh, so that's, that's kind of been the, the smaller group of, of tribes that, that uh, uh, have access for E. Most tribes access, that do access E, and it's a, a little over half uh, of the tribes do have agreements with the state. I believe there are two 4E agreements in, in California. Uh, next slide. Okay, I guess I got ahead of myself. This is the next slide. I, this is as of 2013, so the data is a little uh, old, but there were 98 4 agreements involving 267 Indian tribes in 16 states. And again, as I said, I believe currently there are two 40 agreements in um, California. Next slide. Okay, so, um, so depending on how a tribe accesses family first, uh, it, that really depends on how they can access, I mean, 4E, that depends how they can access family first. So if you have a direct funded tribe, and, and you do have one in this state, uh, and they are not bound by the evidence-based program requirements that states are bound by. They can qualify uh, cultural programs under separate uh, criteria. And some of the criteria laid out in guidance from the Children's Bureau is longevity of the practice, teachings on which the practice is based, uh, the values and principles incorporated into the practice, uh, community leader, elder approval of the practice, and community feedback and evaluation. Of the pro, uh, um, practice sometimes it's called community-based evidence, community-based evidence programs, based on community-based evidence as opposed to evidence-based programs. Um, next slide. Thank you for putting that in. I appreciate that. Um, in the in the chat. Um, so if a tribe accesses 4E through a tribal state agreement then it is bound by the limitations that the state is bound by. So uh, essentially evidence-based programs. Uh, that's the interpretation of the statute that HHS has provided. Uh, it's, it's not without some controversy, although it also, there is a, ra it's, it's not arbitrary either. There is a rationale for how they're interpreting it that way. And so, but that's, that's, what we're, we're dealing with now is that limitation. There have been proposals that have made in both the budget documents of the Trump and Biden administration uh, to um, open up uh, 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 culturally adapted programs to tribes accessing 4E through tribal state agreements. I know there's also been draft legislation that's been put together to do that. Uh, by Senator Murkowski of Alaska, but, but nothing has been introduced and I can't honestly tell you that anything is, is imminent. Uh, just know that the people are aware of that, dis that discrepancy or distinction, and there is some interest in changing that, but right now that's not the reality that we're dealing with. So um, what we're dealing with is if, there, if the tribe is coming in through uh, a state program, then, uh, then they are bound by the evidence-based program requirement. Uh, next slide. So, so how can tribes get involved with Family 4E? Well, for tribes that already have a tribal state agreement, right, that, that agreement would need to be amended to provide for um, direct participation in the Family First program. 
um, they would be uh, permitted, again, to receive reimbursement for evidence-based programs only and would be limited to those in the state plan. Although, if the tribe wants to run an evidence-based program that's not part of the state plan, the state plan can always be amended. Uh, and that will require federal approval, but um, the amendment process hopefully will be much easier than the actual approval process has been for state family first plans uh, so far. Next slide. Okay, so how about tribes who aren't accessing uh, Title IV-E directly? Well, one option uh, potentially is uh, Title IV-E, first let me take a step back. Title IV-E requires states to negotiate 4 e agreements in good faith with tribes that want to request that request to access all or part of the program, right? So uh, the state, one of your neighbors, Oregon, has indicated an interest in doing family first agreements only with tribes. Uh, but so far the Children's Bureau has, has not approved that approach. Uh, I know Oregon has asked for a higher level review of whether that's possible. So sort of again, like the legislative amendments, uh, stay tuned on this. Uh, but of course, this would require much less of a process than a legislative change, uh, which would be an administrative interpretation. So uh, this may, this I won't say, I'm not going to say this will happen, but certainly it has the potential to happen in a much faster time frame than, than the other uh, that I mentioned, right? And then, uh, and so for tribes who, um, who do that, uh, who, if that becomes possible, that can be an easier entree into 4E because they won't have to do things like eligibility determinations, right? We know Family First is based on uh, whether a child is at imminent risk of, foster, of, uh, of coming into the foster care system. It's not based on income. They won't have to do some of the administrative type work around time studies, cost allocations, some of the more complicated um, methodologies, unless they're going to try to claim administrative costs as part of their Family First claims. And again, this is a focus on prevention services to keep families together, which is a priority for many tribes. So, so that may be an option for, if that becomes an option for tribes, that may be something that you're gonna see uh, some of the tribal nations have, uh, have an interest in, since it would be an easier lift than a full-blown uh, 4E agreement. Now, so now what can counties do? So now that's, that's sort of an overview of, of sort of the tribal provisions in Family First and how they can be accessed. But what kinds of actions um, can counties take? And I would say uh, must take, uh, really. And that is, first of all, as you're developing your individual plans, uh, consulting with tribes. Uh, now, let me just say that um, it's entirely up to the tribe if it wants to consult with you. Right? So they don't have a, a legal obligation to do that. Uh, I think like uh, um, the previous speaker was talking about in terms of CBOs, it certainly helps uh, if, if they know that, that there is a, there's motivation to engage in this. Is, this a, is, is it likely to lead to something that's going to be beneficial for their families, that's going to uh, allow them to exercise their uh, sovereign authority more effectively? I mean, <laughs> You know, a tribe, isn't, a tribe doesn't want to simply come and be a checkbox on, on a form somewhere. But if they're, going to, if they're going to consult, they want to feel that it's, it's meaningful, right? Okay, in addition to consultation with tribes, I'll also mention outreach to Native organizations, uh, particularly in urban areas. Uh, there are uh, urban uh, organizations that uh, service the Native populations in those counties. Uh, and there are also intertribal organizations like California Tribal Family Coalition. So, so those organizations can uh, also be um, important partners for you coming in probably through sort of a more of a community-based organization type um, route as opposed to this government-to-government -government relationship that we're talking about between tribes and counties. And I'll, I'll mention just, I know that, for instance, in Colorado, where I am, in, in uh, Denver County, uh, uh, contracts with the Denver Indian Family Resource Center, uh, not necessarily uh, under Family First currently, but many of the programs that they do run and services they provide to uh, their families, I know at least one or two of them are in space programs, and they could be provided 
um, uh, pre-removal as opposed to post-removal, which is what they're contracting to do now. And, and, um, and so uh, those organizations can be uh, 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 part of your community-based organization uh, outreach. And then um, when we talk about developing, develop working with tribes, uh, not just sort of consulting and trying to get their input into your, into your uh, program, although that's important, right? But also there's the potential for agreements with tribes, government to government agreements or service contracts with urban organizations. Um, if a tribe uh, is running an evidence-based program that may be um, uh, work in their community, uh, and I know Casey Family Programs has done a, um, uh, a survey, and I can't remember if I put it in another slide, but if I did, I'll, I'll mention it again, but it has done sort of a survey of evidence-based programs that have been approved, and there are probably half a dozen or so that are being used by, uh, by tribes or have been, have been shown to be effective with Native communities. So if a tribe is running one of those or an urban uh, uh, agency is, or maybe they want to run it, uh, and they can run it in a more culturally effective way. Thank you, Kush. I wasn't sure if I put that slide in, so I appreciate you going to the next slide. So these are all programs that, that have been shown to be effective uh, with American Indian children and or families uh, and or are being run by uh, some tribes in some places, right? So these are programs where you might actually contract with uh, an urban organization or uh, have a government to government agreement with the tribe that involves resources that are going to be passed through to that tribe. Maybe it's state money. Maybe it's family first money that you uh, that you start getting back in reimbursement. Right when you get that family first money back, that's money that's that you don't have to that you can use. You have flexibility to use in a lot of ways. Right, so maybe you use that money if you could go back to the uh, earlier slide. Uh, push just for a second. For a second. All right, so the second option, in addition to those evidence-based programs, is what if, the, what if a, uh, a tribe uh, or an urban program uh, has a, wants to run a culturally-based program? And maybe it's not evidence-based, and so you say, well, we can't really fund this through Family First, but you're getting money back from Family First for programs you're running, and you're getting a pot of money, and that money can be used in any way you choose to use it. So one possible thing to do is to contract with uh, tribes using that new pot of money or maybe other state funds to run those culturally based programs that they know work that are appropriate for their communities um, uh, by using funds that are generated by Family First but not Family First specific funds that you're getting reimbursement for those programs. So that's another thing to, to kind of think about here is how can, what, what would make this most valuable to the native community? What would make this most valuable in terms of the tribes saying, yeah, I want to come forward. I want to be part of this because I can see that it's going to be beneficial because there are, there are ways that we can actually um, get resources to serve service our families in addition to helping identify uh, through, the, through county systems or contractors uh, programs that might benefit uh, the tribal, uh, uh, tribal citizens. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think I already showed you this. You can see that, that these are uh, obviously approved programs. Those asterisks, that the, with three asterisks, that means well supported, and two asterisks is supported, and one asterisk is a promising program. I will point out particularly Family Spirit is the only one of the, these programs that is specifically culturally, culturally based, uh, a native culturally based uh, program. Uh, next slide. Okay, so keep in mind in interacting with tribal nations that tribal capacity varies greatly. You have tribes that have large tribal child welfare and legal departments, uh, and you have tribes that might only have a few employees in their whole um, for their whole uh, tribe, uh, and and you have a, a variety of, of populations. Uh, I know California tends to have smaller populations in general. They don't have large populations like the Navajo Nation. Uh, but, uh, but the tribes that you have 
uh, are uh, uh, do vary in size as well, from thousands and thousands of people to to maybe just a, a, a hundred or two hundred. So, um, and again, I think when I looked at California maps, uh, um, the majority of counties in the state have at least one federally recognized tribe within the county. Uh, and if they don't, then they pro then they are probably an urban county, and they have a tribal population within that county that may involve people from all over the country. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in the 1950s, there was a federal program called relocation. And so a lot of tribal people came from other parts of the country and moved into various cities, including cities in um, California. And so keep in mind, again, there are a variety of tribal cultures. It's not one size fits all. Um, how can you sort of, uh, what can you do to, to uh, help with interaction? Well, I think some of the things that were said about uh, CBOs, in some cases, uh, tribes don't have resources. Some do, but many don't. Can you help pay for travel expenses, for example? Can you hold a meeting in a, in a tribal venue? Uh, that would be another uh, possible way to sort of encourage the tribe to, to be involved. Um, and, and I will also say that um, uh, the tribe needs to decide, you need to respect how the tribe wants to be involved, right? So I know there was a lot of discussion about this collaborative government structure, right? Bringing everyone into the collaborative government structure. Well, some tribes might prefer to participate within the structure, but others may say, no, we are sovereign. We don't want to be in that structure. That structure should be dealing with us as a separate entity, just like it deals with the state, right? Just like it might deal with another county, right? They're not I'm just another stakeholder. Um, they are uh, a gov another government that you are dealing with. And so, uh, now, so that the tribe may insist that that's the way it wants to interact. And so you need to know what, what, how the tribe feels about that. That will often be the case. But then again, you might also get one person at the tribe who says, you know, I'm okay attending those government meetings and just participating, recognizing that we still have this government to government relationship over here. So, that is something that you can only find out by engaging with the tribe to see how they want to be involved, assuming that they do uh, want to be involved. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so again, in, in, in interacting with tribal nations, some of the things that were talked about with CBOs to apply here, again, respect, being valued, um, knowing a little bit about the tribe, uh, before you uh, uh, in, engage with them, but also exercising humility. Um, the fact that you went on their website and read something about the tribe or otherwise found out something about the tribe does not make you a tribal expert. The tribe is an expert about its own governance, its own culture, but knowing a little bit when you come in is always, <clears throat> is always helpful. Um, come in with appropriate expectations. Um, you know, this is a, again, this, this is a, a dialogue between governments. So you're not coming in at saying what you expect, or you're not coming in with a preconceived agenda. Uh, you can you can certainly provide information. Um, you know, here's here's some things we're already doing. We want you to know about, but not coming in with a preconceived agenda. Let the agenda flow from that, that government to government relationship, or better yet, develop the agenda jointly uh, before you come in. So there's agreement on what it what it looks like. Right. Uh, don't be, uh, don't come in and be defensive. Um, you know, uh, many tribes have not had great experiences with state and county systems. There has been conflict. Uh, they have felt that, that counties have not dealt with their children properly, have not dealt with the tribe properly. And so sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the tribe may come in and, and be suspicious or, or uh, not had a good experience in the past, but don't be defensive. Uh, you need to get past that and you just need to, to engage. Uh, and remember, uh, it, again, it shouldn't be a checkbox situation. It's not just a one, uh, a one and done. Uh, just as with CBOs, relationships are important. If you can develop those more generally, maybe through some of the IPA cases in your county, you're developing relationships, or in a lot of ways, you might be developing relationships. Um, uh, you know, that if you have those relationships, it will make it, things go better. I, I, I presume in the chat, I had provided 
uh, a link to the list of Indian Child Welfare Agents in the Federal Register. In case you haven't had contact with the tribe and you want to know who to contact, that can be a place to start. I would emphasize the Indian Child Welfare Agent may not always be the same person who's dealing with social services in the tribe more generally. So that may not be the person that you're ultimately going to engage with, but at least if you really don't know where to start, that person may help you, you know, sort of uh, go through um, uh, that process. That's uh, what was posted. That's not the particular, there's another post, I think, um, that I provided, hopefully that you can, if you haven't put in the chat, you can also put in the chat with those tribal agents. If not, we'll get it out to you somehow if it's not posted. Um, so the last thing I'm, I want to end up with is to also think about this engagement with tribes, not just as an obligation or something that you have to do, realize that that if you do a develop a, a working relationship with um, tribes, there there's a lot of things that were talked about earlier that you can help address through that relationship. The tribe can be a resource um, uh, in, in important ways. Uh, the, some of the things that I was writing down during earlier presentations, things like uh, gaps in service offerings. Tribe may have an offering that, 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 that you don't know about, or maybe the Indian Health Service does that the tribe works with. Um, equitable, equity, uh, making sure you have equity in your, your practices and your services. Um, serving those disproportionately at risk. We know that the placement of Native children is higher than, than other populations, although you know, in your particular jurisdiction that may or may not uh, be true. Cultural responsiveness, right? If you're going to be responsive to this uh, population, uh, working with tribes uh, is important. Uh, systematic involvement with diverse communities. That was another thing that I heard. Uh, if you're not gonna be involved with the, the uh, American Indian Alaska Native community without um, uh, tribal engagement. And keep in mind, that in in your if you're dealing particularly with a local tribe, uh, that tribe they know the families. They may be engaging with families that you want to engage with. You know those connections, the same kinds of connections that were talked about in terms of community-based organizations. Uh, that tribal community have those can have those same relationships, which again can help what you're doing as a county uh, be more effective as well. So I think that's I think I. I think that's the last slide, um, and so I will stop there. Uh, I've run through this very quickly, obviously, as have all the presenters. So if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to post them, or I know there's another Q&A session coming up. I'd be glad to uh, address um, any of this further. And that's my contact information. Please feel free to, to uh, reach out. Thank you so much, Jack. I really appreciate it. Uh, you are someone who is sought after in high demand, and I really appreciate you making the time to be with us today. So, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and um, uh, pretty soon here we're going to open it up for questions. We have a few minutes for those, and I've got some teed up. But before I go to that, um, I, I want to I want you to. To, to hear from, from someone who you know well, who sits at a whole bunch of these um, governance body tables um, as a partner, as a funder, as a thought partner. Um, and so Dana Blackwell, I, I wanna just ask you if you've got anything um, for the audience. I mean, you just, you do this so much and you, you've been part of ones that work You've been part of the uh, ones that struggle. So what, what what would you say to our listeners about what to keep in mind as they go about choosing and developing and chartering this governance body that's gonna oversee prevention? Well, the good news is, is that I'm not gonna say anything different than anybody on the panel has already raised, right? Um, the, the bodies that, um, are successful are those that have clarity of purpose. What is the goal of this particular group? And, I, and I'll, I'll use some examples. So David and Kathy co-chair um, the Prevention Early Intervention Committee for the Child Welfare Council. It is clear what we are doing. 
We are identifying prevention strategies. We are exploring the impact of those and we are lifting them up in terms of recommendations for the Child Welfare Council. It is clear what we are doing. Um, and that makes my participation on that subcommittee very clear. I, um, Casey is a national organization and we understand what's happening, the, the prevention landscape nationally. I can bring resources to that committee to think about and, and sort of apply to the California context. Um, equity and diversity. So all the people who sit at the table have an equal voice of influence and decision-making. So there is not one member of, of that body or any other successful body whose voice and influence and participation and decision-making is less than or more than. There is equity across its members and that there is a diversity of the people who are at the table, right? It is not just the government agencies. It is those people who will be impacted by service. It is, um, it is, it, it could be the diversity of um, government agencies, right? That there is not one perspective that is influencing any recommendation, any action, um, and, we hope that there is diversity amongst the people in terms of race and ethnicity, especially because we want to impact disproportionality and improve equity. And a particular experience as a Black woman, as a Black person, is different um, than uh, my Latinx friends. And so having diversity across who is sitting at that table is equally as important as well as who they represent in terms of um, agency or community. Um, respect, Jack just brought up the issue of respect and value. Um, and, it, and it goes to, you know, the diversity and equity that each person brings a different experience, perspective, and expertise. It's important that those experiences, perspectives, and expertise are valued by the group, right? Um, there is, you can have people at the table, but not, not um, expressing sort of um, the value that that um, experience, expertise, and perspective brings to the charge of that group, um, you know, you just want to make sure that you do that. Um, and then relationship, 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 right? Um, when we're in, you know, Kathy made the point that she's not in relationship with ADAP. She's in relationship with the CEO of ADAP. Right, and it's really important that, and David made this point too, that when we are together, we learn about each other, about our goals, and where there is shared and, and shared values and shared goals. And then we begin thinking about together how to achieve those goals together. And we can't get to change without being in relationship. And then I guess um, the last I would say is communication. I mean, there is communication amongst the members of the committee or the governing body, but there is also the need to communicate outward. If we are coming together for change, then we need to broadcast our thinking, our recommendations, more broadly so we can influence transformation. And Ventura is just a very beautiful example of that when they took their ILT to the Board of Supervisors, right? There is a level of buying in Ventura County around their wellness program that would not have been achieved had they not gone to their Board of Supervisors. That, that the, 
the the road that they showed on one of those slides or even the quilt cannot could not come together and you couldn't travel that journey unless you're communicating out and bringing in so they brought in community, they brought in their boards of supervisors. So their, their efforts, I am positive, will be much more successful. And so those would be the, the key takeaways that I, so when I'm part of a, a successful body, those things are in place. Thank you so much, Dana. Yep. yep. So, so um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the time and it is for exactly this reason that, that we've adopted a format here in this learning series where we have a, we have the presentation, the form more one directional presentation. And then a couple weeks later, we bring our, our speakers back to be a panel and to answer, answer questions. And those questions are collected from the session itself, from the registration for the session and from um, a, a form that you'll get after the session. And so what I'm gonna do is instead of trying to squeeze in 20 seconds of questions for each of our, um, each of our uh, speakers, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close our session and do our wrap up and invite you to register for the Q&A session, the questions that you've put in the Q&A box will be brought forward. Um, we will have time to ask questions there, uh, both in a large group and likely specifically um, to, you know, in, in small groups with our, our speakers who will then be panelists. And then we are working furiously to write down answers to the questions that in addition to the ones um, answered, uh, out loud that we weren't able to answer. We want to re release a written document um, that that has answers to some of those questions um, as we've researched them with our panelists. So uh, as the moderator, that's the executive decision I'm making. Uh, and I am going to turn it back over to our, our gracious hosts at Caltrin um, who make us look very, very, very good during this learning series. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists and all the speakers today on behalf of the attendees. Uh, we want to say thank you for your time 